Loud and clear, I'll say it in the chamber next week. Well, can I just say a huge thank you to all of you for watching and listening, whether you've been at home, in your car, driving to get to your Sunday lunch, which I am very much looking forward to because I don't know about you, I'm starving at this time on a Sunday. But thank you so much for your comments, for getting involved and for really, you know, sharing what you think, particularly some of your suggestions for what the Chancellor should be doing during his budget, which I absolutely will feed in when I'm back at work tomorrow. So from me to you, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Enjoy that Sunday lunch um, and make sure you stay tuned in to listen to Petra because it sounds like she's got a fantastic show coming up. I've been Deanna Davison. This has been Talk TV. Hopefully see you again soon. This is Talk TV. For the news that matters, for the opinions that matter, for the stories that matter, find me, Vanessa Phelps, every weekday at 4pm, only on Talk, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Oh, this, bless him, he's soaking wet. Yes. The most likely situation is that that statue is going to end up in M Shed, which is a museum just on the harbour. Nick, I, when we first went to you, I thought you dived into the harbour to get the, get the thing out. For God's sake, man, well done, good job. Islamism is sweeping our nation. This is not Islamophobia, this is real. Another terror attack, another killing of an MP. Oh, don't worry, let's light a candle, let's all sing, let's look, don't look back in anger and sing Kumbaya. David Cameron needs to worry about his own country, and frankly, he can kiss my ass. Yeah. Boom, fantastic. We need a bit more of that in the UK. I can't wait to hear Liz Truss say something like that. She's saying saying what a lot of people think. Not if you can't then... call Hamas terrorists, I can't talk to you. Cut the interview. Fine. Goodbye. He had a, a politically uh, minded project called WikiLeaks. It said yeah. nothing about what was going on in the Kremlin, nothing about what was going on in China. There was a clear political bias in what he was doing. This is the first time Millam has heard of asylum seekers coming to the town. If we are guinea pigs, then I think we should have been consulted. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Well, it will be a problem if they start breaking into people's homes because they can break into yours and decide that you're not doing enough. <laughs> they can break into mine and decide I'm not doing enough. And I'll tell you what, if they break into my home, it will get violent, that's for sure. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? You've been having to fight again for compensation after having to fight to be believed, then fight to get your conviction quashed, to get what's rightfully yours. If Archetypes was as successful as they claim, why is Spotify that paid Harry and Meghan a significant amount of money to produce 13 episodes? episodes in total, including the Christmas special, willing to hand that over to Limonada to do whatever they want with it. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on mm. the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know, it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested Alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square because you've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> to <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. There are no banners calling for the release of the condemn, hostages. They will not there condemn are no banners, Hamas. Kevin. You can't say everyone on that march. Not, when no, can't say them Hamas. Sorry, no. I'm yeah. sorry, I've got, I've got you both. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, you can't. Good. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names. The New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn. What? What is that? What on earth? is going on in the House of Commons. I'll try my very best to explain that, Daisy, but it is an extremely complicated situation. This just absolutely stinks. Right, Neil Parrish, he was great for his area. Rishi Sunak should have brought him out today and said, this guy's going to be advised You're by a special counsel. Right. If anybody can pull it off, it'll be him. Oh, <laughs> what? Oh. What? <laughs> your your mind. <laughs> it's not our mind, it's your mouth, Mr. Unbelievable. Collins. Unbelievable. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Look, I'm getting ready for my new primetime show on talk TV and radio, 7 o'clock Saturday night, James Whale. Good afternoon, it is Petri here with you through until four o'clock this Sunday um, and I hope you've got the time to spend with me and that you can make some calls as well because this programme is all about you, it's all about your reaction, about what you want and what you want to talk about so I will be taking your calls throughout the programme. Um, coming up we're going to be talking about the spiking epidemic, there are so many complaints about spiking now, spiking drinks both men and women saying that their drinks are being poisoned and that they are being taken advantage of when that happens. These numbers are going through the roof. So we're going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about the car finance scandal. Did you buy a car on credit? Did you buy one with an, with an interest rate or one of those, I don't know, you pay monthly things? Chances are you may well have been ripped off. So you're going to want to stay and have a listen because this could be and probably will be the new PPI. Lloyds Bank is setting aside £450 million in order to pay back people who were paying the wrong interest. So if you think you might be one of those, you need to keep listening. And also you can call in and let me know. Um, also, I want to know if any of you men out there wear makeup. Come on, be honest. Go on, be honest. I know you do. I know you do. Um, so give me a call. What makeup do you wear? Do you just wear the odd bit of mascara? Maybe a bit of foundation? This is not just women and gay men. I mean, some of my gay friends wear way too much. Way too much. But this is all men now wearing makeup. And why not? It's the best invention ever. I would certainly not be on screen without it. So we're going to be talking about makeup as well. And do you have lions and tigers and bears, oh my, living next door? You might do. So keep listening or watching to find out exactly what's going on. Uh, now, though, let me introduce uh, my guest for the first hour, Laura McHenry, who's a journalist. Hi. Good afternoon to you. So we, we've got to talk, we've got a lot of stories actually to get through in this hour. Um, but everybody is talking about bodyguards for MPs. Now these are three female MPs that are um, across the political spectrum. We don't know who they are for security reasons. Um, but they are being given chauffeur driven cars and close protection officers. This is just out after the, the last week and that, that debacle mm. we saw in the Commons, which was frankly shameful. Um, what do you what do you make of this? I mean it's obviously a terrible situation to be in where people's lives feel like they're uncertain and unsafe and they've got to have bodyguards. At the same time I think it's a good place that we're in that we can do this. That actually we are able to have people step up and say, I don't feel safe that there are processes in place so that they can get that protection. And this isn't something new. I was thinking today about the fact that, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, when there was conflict happening uh, between uh, the English government, the IRA, um, of course, you had Margaret Thatcher at the time, the Prime Minister, uh, in a hotel that was bombed. And mm. it, that was a really challenging time. People were killed as part of that conflict. And it's something that MPs have faced in the past. I think at the time, we sometimes felt that what was going on was, you know, this hardness. Margaret Thatcher would go out and sort of say how she was unafraid. But, you know, she did have protection officers. She did have cars moving her around. And I think the fact that we're talking about this now and we're saying, look, this is really difficult is important. You should have those protections, but it would be better to be in a place where we don't need them at all. Well, that's the point, isn't it? Because one of the, the fundamentals of our democracy is that our MPs are um, available to mm. us, that they are easily sought out, they are, they're, they're meant to be easy to talk to. That's what a constituency MP is meant to be. If we start locking constituency MPs behind doors or have intimidating uh, protection around them where you might want to talk about something really personal, something deeply, uh, you know, that, that you want to keep to yourself and you, but you need help from your MP, this is going to change democracy over a, a fight that is happening um, somewhere else. Oh, 
we have to try and keep as much of that constituency link as possible. I lived out in the US for a period of time and it always struck me as how different it was. Mm. You know, you, you would have a presidential election and there's Barack Obama at the time being sort of flown around in planes, whereas over here in England you'll have politicians in sort of bakery caps out, uh, handing out loaves yeah. in their local bakery. And I think we've got to keep that. I think it actually does mean that there is that personal connection. Um, but then you can also have safety measures. You know, is it actually fair in a constituency that you have to have meetings with people who you maybe don't? don't know uh, on your own or unsafe and we've already put in place uh, a, a range of things I think so people aren't going to be meeting people uh, on their own so you've, you've got to think through what these threats are and we don't know who these people are or what the threats are that they're facing but having slightly stepped up security is probably going to be right in the meantime but it doesn't mean that will stop that connection. Well I hope it doesn't mean that it stops that connection because uh, as it is there is no trust. Mm. The, 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 the MPs, yeah. Parliament, the political classes uh, appear to have completely eroded the trust that they have with the electorate. Uh, the amount of people I talk to say I'm politically homeless, the amount of people who I talk to said I'm not going to vote, and I'm like, no, you must vote, it's really important, um, you know, uh, or, or, or at least go there and, and spoil, your, your, spoil your ballot. Do something mm -hmm. to register your, your uh, you know, fury with this, but n not out on the streets, not attacking uh, MPs over, over a decision. And I, and I have to be honest with you, the, the whole Gaza um, situation, I mean, it is, is absolutely disgraceful what's going on out there it's horrible there are no winners here um, and and nobody is going to win this right we we know that but but whatever we do in this country is not going to affect that it is not so why is this intimidation and bullying of MPs um, and and they've said that they're going to step this up to, to try and get MPs to be deselected that didn't vote for a ceasefire. It won't make any difference anyway. I, I'm, com I'm really confused about this. I think one of the problems is when uh, each side feels like they're not getting some level of respect. So you'll often hear this idea that um, it's the other side, we want revenge. And actually what we have to get back to is conversations about what do we do next and that got lost this week actually i think it was a real shame that in a big uh hoo-ha over parliamentary procedure and i understand the speaker of the house did something wrong he, he should have listened to his clerks and I, he yeah, apologized and I, I do i do believe you know him and him saying I, I i offered this extra vote to keep mps safe is deeply concerning and also what he it wasn't what he should do right no. that isn't the convention no. so he did something wrong but i also felt like it got us away from the actual debate which was about what what is the next step here like people want to get into the history but we we do have to think about what happens next but we also have to recognize both sides and there's something very powerful at times when both sides can articulate the pain of the other and that's been a little bit missed in this and i do feel like the politicians haven't taken steps to try and recognize sometimes the pain of the other but haven't we got to remember that we are a tiny player now yeah. on the world stage we really are we're a tiny little, almost insignificant island uh, off the coast of Europe now. Um, even if we came up with the perfect plan, it's not our plan. It's not our country. I mean, it's like those people who are saying, oh, well, you know, Zelensky should capitulate to, to Russia and give him half his... Well, that's not our decision to make. That is Ukraine's decision to make. What happens in the Middle East is the, is the Middle East decision to make. You know, there is very little pressure mm. that we can bring to bear that hasn't already been brought to bear. Yeah, I do think that as a country we sometimes get the balance of international versus domestic policy wrong. It's something we've done for about 150 years where we tend to spend a lot of time talking about things overseas when we've got things to solve here. At the same time though, we can't get away from the fact that international offence do affect here. Uh, they affect us in lots of different ways. Ukraine, for example, has been a part of why we've had such big inflation. So it's incumbent on us as a major nation, often a very wealthy nation compared to others, to try and do things that make are a we difference. Are a major nation? Yeah, I think we are still. Are we? we are. I mean, I know it's, it feels everything is broken and that we're slipping behind, but at the same time... Which you know, we are. I mean, I, look at the NHS are. is dropping down the charts. Yeah. I mean, even our economy is 100%. dropping down the chart. You know, everything. But I don't think we can deny the fact that, like, David Cameron is, on a global stage, somebody that is well-known. And as the Foreign Secretary, can he intervene and have meetings that others perhaps can't? Might can be well he be known, listened but is he to? Well, liked? well, I think there's or something respected. about trying and being seen to try, because if mm. we were in the circumstances, 
places internationally where we needed support and help. We would want to be able to call on others, and I don't think you can but step back now. I haven't heard uh, um, uh, anybody calling on us, particularly for help. In, in this I mean, in Ukraine there is, right? Mm -hmm. they, want, they want money and they want arms and everything. But in, in the situation in Gaza, I, I'm, I'm not aware of, of people saying that Britain can go in and affect any changes. Well, whether we can affect changes or not, the idea that we would let a, a, big, a big conflict situation that could have global consequences not do anything, I think... Uh, is unlikely. And again, that is why we have a foreign secretary to get involved in a whole diplomatic service and a whole bunch of people involved in these things. Whether it should be taking up as much time as it is, whether in fact in, we in should be parliament. putting... Yeah. yeah, in Parliament. That for me is a bit of an issue and I do tend to be somebody who thinks that we should focus on domestic policy at least as much and it does feel like that well, has I, been lost this week. I, well, I'd like them to focus on domestic policy for a minute. I mean, <laughs> it doesn't seem... And in fact, let's have some policies. Why not? We haven't got any for the election. I haven't seen any. Have you? No, it does feel as if at the <sighs> moment things like the NHS, um, we're not really hearing anything uh, from the current government on what they want to do. And I get it. They're probably going to keep their the, powder dry. The for potential for government in, in waiting either. Have, have a policy you don't flip flop on immediately. Yeah. Uh, Labour's obviously the challenge for them is that I think they don't want to say too much without an economic situation that's going to be better for them. But again, I would like to hear some punchier policies. Um, I don't think it's going to be very helpful for them. I can't think of them. any real policy. Well, they want to... So, for instance, even just today uh, in the papers, there's been this fight over how many more doctors we should be training. Labour have said that they would double that. The Conservatives at a certain point have said they would also double it. This year, to do that, you need about 7,500 more doctors, and they've said this year there'll be 350 more places. So the Conservatives have really let themselves down on that. Labour are still saying they will do it, but how they will do it isn't being told yeah, so, so that's not it's very policy, easy at the moment that's to just promise policy. something yeah, exactly yeah. Uh, let's take a call now and andre is in wiltshire um good afternoon andre good afternoon um what did you want to say about uh, the mps being given bodyguards it's a real sorry state of affairs isn't it well under the terrorism act anybody that makes a threat against any mps or any members of parliament at all they can be removed from the country under the uh, administration of um, anti anti-terrorism act and that's a statutory... Well, uh, hang on a minute, that's assuming, of course, that the threat has come from somebody who well, isn't British. Well, the thing, it, it doesn't matter who they are. Anti-terrorism has got no, no racial discrimination whatsoever. But they, you can't remove... You, you, it's, it's actually illegal to render somebody stateless. So if, if it's a British person that was being accused of terrorism offences, there's nowhere to remove them to. You can't, they, legally. Anybody in this country that, that's doing anti-terrorism act, if they're not from this country, they can be deported. If they're from this country, they can be arrested. They can be arrested, yeah, and if they're not from this in country, prison, meaning... OK, but then, but then they need to... I suppose they need to be able to nail down exactly who these people are. Well, um, TV all the way around London, it's pretty much... Uh, we've got the most, most amount of CCTV in London. Surely the CCTV should be able to pick out who's done what. Well, it's, it, it's online threats as well, don't forget. Well, whatever. But if you've got online stuff, you've got a, a PS number. No, I mean, not always, because people, people do hide behind um, um, stuff, don't they? They hide behind the technology. But I, I suspect the police are trying to find these people who are threatening MPs, and I suspect they are trying to, to arrest them. So if they can't find them, does that mean that our security system is null and void? Well, not really. It just means they can't be found, because they're hiding behind too many layers of technology. If they can find them, if they can do it in America and they can do it in, in Europe, why can't we do it in Britain? No, because, because I, think, I, think, I think maybe, Andre, you and I watch too many films where it's easy to track these people down, and, and, it, and, it, and it isn't always. They can go through proxies, they Not can set up fake on accounts. And they... on about what's done in, in the internet system. Yeah, you but people can set up... People... Surely Britain's got hackers that are working for the government. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, but you can set up fake accounts, can't you, and do, the, do it from so the library... Government. So can government. Where did the 8.5 million go during the pandemic? Da -da. I don't see what you're talking about. You don't see what I'm talking about. The relevance is internet banking and internet security is all tied together. Mm. Yeah, but it's different to sending emails, isn't it? Or threats via Twitter uh, or X or... Where's the difference, sending an email to sending a bank account? Because you can set up a fake one. 
you can you're not going to set up a fake bank account because then you can't get your money out but you can't you can set up a fake internet account and a fake name and 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 send the emails from a, a library or so something so how are they going to find them is it different between terrorism banking or personal um, emails i think i've explained it i think i've explained it andre um I mean, this is the problem, isn't it, uh, uh, Laura? It, it's, it's. It, I'm sure the police are trying to track these people down, but it is quite difficult to do so. I mean, having had lots of threats myself um, mm -hmm. on on a Twitter now X. Um, these people are very difficult to find. They are, and also we have this constant problem in the law of the difference between uh, harassment or threats, which are and can still be crimes, but also people who actually do things. And that's the sort of thing, you know, if you actually are attacked, then that person may well be put away in prison. With a lot of threats, um, they're unlikely to be given prison time. If they are, it's likely to be very short and they can get back out again. Mm. And of course, that's because we protect the idea that someone having thoughts about things or someone planning to do something isn't necessarily the same as them doing it. And, you know, stalking cases have this problem all of the time, for instance, where someone is threatening or harassing somebody, but they've not actually done it. And that person can only be put away for two, mm. three, four years. And then they get back out and they start again. And so there's always this constant balance with this sort of protection of you're sort of waiting for things to happen, but you don't want to wait. And so that's yeah, why I mean, that's the thing, is it? it if it's, it's already too late once it's happened, but in some cases, you have to wait until something has happened exactly and so and also just building the cases together so that people can be uh, prosecuted for instance for planning a terrorist attack these are very difficult and complicated things to do they rely on systems of uh, informants often sources um, all kinds of work yeah. no and so it's hard the Met Police I think do work hard at it but it takes a lot of resources and in the end if you do it successfully nothing happens and that also you know no one it's no captain ever gets congratulated for taking a ship around the storm basically yeah, exactly exactly uh, right we're going to take a quick break but uh, do give me a call the number you're going to need is 0344 499 what do you think of the state of politics that these MPs are now having to have bodyguards uh, close protection officers chauffeur driven cars all of this you and I are paying for but there is no other option and in fact the security end of this are asking for more money from uh, Rishi Sunak so that more MPs can be protected. What does that say about our democracy? 0344 499 1000. Back in a sec. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaking. Oh, it's, bless him, he's soaking wet. Well. The most likely situation is that that statue is going to end up in M Shed, which is a museum just on the harbour. Nick, I, when we first went to you, I thought you dived into the harbour to get the, get the thing out, for God's sake, man. Well done, good job. Islamism is sweeping our nation. This is not Islamophobia, this is real. Another terror attack, another killing of an MP. Oh, don't worry, let's light a candle, let's all sing, let's look, don't look back in anger and sing Kumbaya. He had a, a politically-minded uh, project called WikiLeaks, which said nothing about what was going on in the Kremlin, nothing about what was going on in China. There was a clear political bias in what he was doing. This is the first time Millam has heard of asylum seekers coming to the town. If we are guinea pigs, then I, I think we should have been consulted. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Well, it will be a problem if they start breaking into people's homes because they can break into yours and decide that you're not doing enough. <laughs> they can break into mine and decide I'm not doing enough. And I'll tell you what, if they break into my home, it will get violent. That's for sure. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? You know? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, is it? There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know, uh? it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs>
There are no banners calling for and the re release of the condemn, hostages. They will not there are no Hamas. banners, Kevin. You can't say everyone on that march not, when no, it no, comes to no, Hamas. Sorry, no, I'm yeah. sorry, I've got, I've got you both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you can't. Like, good. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? What on earth is going on in the House of Commons? I'll try my very best to explain that, Daisy, but it is an extremely complicated situation. This just absolutely stinks. Right, Neil Parrish, he was great for his area. If Richard Sunak actually have brought him out today and said, this guy's going to be advised by a special right. If anybody can pull it off, it'll be him. Oh, <laughs> what? Oh. What? <laughs> Your <laughs> mind. <laughs> it's not our mind, it's your mouth, Mr. Unbelievable. Collins. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Hello, good afternoon. It's Petri here. I know, I'm not normally here in the afternoons, but um, I am today and I'm with you until four o'clock. Um, and we've been talking to Laura McKinnery, who's a journalist, about the state of democracy. Um, and, and just before we finish this conversation and move on to, to uh, talking about Lee Anderson, um, do we, is there a sense that democracy is becoming under threat, if you like. Because if, if MPs are being told, look, if you don't vote the way we want you to vote, we will hurt you, that's not, that's not how we do things in this country. No, and I think that's why, again, the speaker this week uh, tried to take an action because of that and was rightly he rebuked for it. He kowtowed to the, to the threat. Yeah, and apologised. Um, I don't he, think he would do it again. No, and he said, it was a mistake, we make mistakes. Um, it's always challenging. There's always threats, I think, to democracy. It's not an easy thing to live with. We, it means we all have to make lots of compromises and sometimes it feels more unstable and other times it feels a bit more like we're all in agreement. At the moment, it feels more unstable. But actually, I think Britain, for all it's got a quirky system, it has lasted a really long time and it's because there are various checks and balances and even just this week, the fact that the Speaker of the Commons, who should be able to kind of make the rules, was able to be rebuked and ended up apologising mm. shows that there are quite good checks and balances but we can't that come in have pro-palestinian marchers or or, or uh, people hanging out uh, uh, by mp's houses and intimidating them i mean that that's just not the way it's done we shouldn't have the, i mean a demonstration is one thing you know how you know a peaceful demonstration is one thing but 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 intimidating i mean if they started to do it to journalists mm -hmm. to make us say what they wanted us to say um as opposed to what we really believe or indeed looking at the facts of the case then i wouldn't be very happy about it and and the country shouldn't be happy about it because we can't have a country that is run by a small group of people with their own ideology the country has to be run by all of us um, uh, because we, we can't have this situation. Yeah, and I think that has been taken very seriously this week, hence why we've got the situation where MPs are now getting more protection. I do know there was a Labour MP writing today who said that around 10, 15 years ago when she was first given a death threat and flagged it to people in authority, nothing happened. This week, it's been so prompt that the police mm. have been running after her asking for extra information. So um, we have to rely on the justice system, we have to rely on the laws that are already in place. And if we feel that there are more laws or that there should be harsher sentences for people who are giving threats, then that is something that Parliament can enact and they will have to take those decisions. But there's also a fear, though, around talking about the situation yeah. at the moment because, you know, if, if it were just stop oil that were taking over London every weekend, which they did for a while, many people commented on that and everybody was furious about it. Fewer people are commenting on the fact that every single weekend, and not just at the weekend now, all the time, Time, these pro-Palestinian marchers are disrupting normal lives and and we we used to hear parliamentarians all the time saying just stop oil they shouldn't be allowed to disrupt the normal people going about their everyday business well we had a bridge closed the other day uh, by these pro-Palestinian marchers but there is a fear and, and this is the sense that I get mm -hmm. uh, at the moment in this country you can't mention the fact they're pro-Palestinian you can't mention the fact that they're Muslim 
Muslim, you can't mention the fact. You, and because it's too scary. And that is stifling conversation. That well, is suppressing freedom of speech. I think there's a separation of these two things, though. One is about protest behaviours and whether or not they're acceptable, regardless of what but the issue is. But you have to is. admit that when it was Just Stop Oil, when it was a safe one to talk about, everybody was piling in and going, we can't have Just Stop Oil, you know, taking over bridges and stopping people going about their normal business. I don't hear that about these marches that have been going on incessantly now since October the 7th and, and show no sign of abating. I think that's because as we've got a conflict which has got two sides in which people um, disagree. So, of course, we've got on one side how many, Israel State how many and the Palestinian pro State. Israeli and so, marches do we see? No, I know, but I feel like when people want to talk about it because it's pro Palestinian, it gets us into a debate again, which drags us back to the conflict of who is right. Is it Israel? Is it to do with Palestine? Should we be taking sides? Whereas instead, if what we can talk about is the protest behaviour, and I understand that means we're taking off the table the topic, but we're doing so for a reason, which is if this is genuinely about the disruption to life the topic doesn't matter the fact that people could say before the just oil protests and they could do so easily was because there wasn't another side and there wasn't a conflict that was bigger and dragged us into a different debate so we should just focus on the protest so you don't behaviors. think it's a fear of, of saying certain words in public no i because think i do i think there is a genuine fear and actually on both sides i think there are people who feel that they're unable to criticize uh, the state of Israel. I feel that there are people who are able, that feel unable to um, to support Israel. I think, and the same on the Palestinian side. And so, I think there is a fear all around of how do we have a debate when tensions are so high that if you say something wrong, then you could end up. But with there shouldn't death be something that you say wrong in this country. There should not be. It needs to. We need to have open debates we need to have an open narrative and say look it, you know war is disgusting people it, nobody mm. wins a war nobody i mean it is revolting disgusting i've been a war reporter i've been that i've seen it and nobody nobody wins that you might get a victor but nobody wins those things right mm -hmm. um but uh, w why can't we have an open uh, a more open discussion about this and say look you know this is a democracy this is not uh, a country where you can bully people or threaten people mm -hmm. into doing what you want them to do and that is certainly what's happening at the moment hence the security for MPs. Oh, but I think most people would agree with everything you've just said I certainly do I think most people listening would but then we do get into what is it okay to say and some people feel that you should be allowed to say absolutely anything at all uh, any words that you use any insinuations you make are fine because that's part of freedom of speech and then there there are others who would say that there are certain things you must not say. There are certain words, there are certain phrases, which are... Um, like from the river to the sea, which was projected onto one of the symbols of democracy in this country. That's not acceptable. No, and that's, I think, one of those ones again where... And yet the, the majority police stood around and went... Say, yeah, and I... Look, I'm, I just I hold my head. I just don't know what to do. I just don't know what to say about it. No, and it's really difficult. I think... Policing in these circumstances is hard. We saw, we've seen this repeatedly in London with various different types of protests over the year, whether it's from Black Lives Matter, whether over Sir Everard and everything else. The police are constantly having to make this decision around policing by consent. Ultimately, if they over-police, you can end up with oh, they, riots they that get out win. of control. Yeah. And so that's where I feel for the police. And, you know, I, I can have views on, obviously, I think that was an inappropriate thing and they should have done apolitical. something. But they have to be apolitical. They yes. have to be apolitical and they haven't been. Um, and, and we've seen them... So, for example, Black Lives Matter taking the knee. Now, whilst many people might agree with that as a moral principle, what if it was something I didn't agree with and they took the knee or they did a salute or they did... Do you know what I mean? Then we'd be going, oh, you can't take a political side. Yeah. So you can't have it both ways. And the police have been trying to have it both ways and it doesn't work. It, it is doesn't very, work. It's very difficult. I think football got into this territory as well. We obviously saw the same with uh, footballers taking the knee over matters of race and then when it came to the Qatar World Cup, mm. not being willing to stand up there for rights for the lesbian, gay, bisexual, yeah. transgender community. Yeah. And so so ultimately, all women. you all women, of course, yeah, and so you end up in this situation where people um, who maybe should have stayed apolitical. I understand why they felt they could do one and not the other, but it puts them in difficult, really, it really difficult it territory. It really, really does. But the police have got to be straight down the line there. They can't, they can't be seen, uh, you know, to favour one side of an argument. Um, Andrew is in Halifax. Uh, good afternoon, Andrew. 
Oh, hello, Petri. Hiya. And what do you make Hi. about the MP's security situation? Well, I think there's, there's actually a very, very important thing that, uh, that nearly everyone in the media has overlooked here mm -hmm. in a wider context. And this is the first time in British parliamentary history that parliamentary protocol has been broken because MPs fear for their own personal safety. That has never happened before. It didn't happen when they were imposing security measures in Northern Ireland. It didn't happen when, for example, they were suggesting sanctions on Russia or even when they were voting on various motions during the Second World War. And this has come down to what I call the Colonel Nicholson moment. At the end of Bridge on the River Kwai, when Colonel Nicholson, Alec Guinness, realises that he's actually been helping the enemy and he goes and he falls on the detonator to blow up the bridge. And I just wonder if any of these MPs have, have reached their own Colonel Nicholson moment because these people have championed open borders and unfettered multiculturalism for decades. And I just wonder now if they realise that it's all come back to bite them on their own backsides. I, I mean, look, there's definitely going to be lots of questions asked, more appropriately about about uh, get, getting people to assimilate properly, getting people to want to be part of this community. But it still doesn't stop people wanting to support their own um, issues, and, their, and 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 I I support that. I just don't support it in the face of other people not having their say or being afraid to say what they want to say. Um, but Andrew, you could be right. I mean, only the MPs can answer that. Um, it, 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 this is the thing, isn't it, that in, where there is a, um, a vacuum of democratic conversation, people will, will, will begin to say their own thing to fill that vacuum. Yeah, I think that does happen. And, and we have to just continue to do do the right thing. I mean, that's why it was so important that the speaker did apologise and said that it was a mistake. We also can't be afraid of making mistakes if constantly every time one of us says something wrong, um, that there isn't the opportunity to apologise and there isn't opportunity to get oh, it correct. Will be fine, won't then, you? then I think we yeah. do get into a worse position. And so there's something here that's about being brave and courageous, but there's also something about being forgiving and allowing a bit of give and take on both sides. As well, I think. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I just, I just despair of the shutting down of conversation. It's always worried me. Um, let's talk about. Can't shut him down. Lee Anderson uh, could be heading for a reform. Um, the the uh, the Nigel Farage, who is not leader of reform, is he entices. Yep. Anyway, Farage is apparently suggesting that. Um, that he go across to reform. Uh, do you think we'll see a lot, because a lot of uh, Tory MPs are looking to step down. Mm -hmm. um, not that they'll have much choice, but anyway, um, looking to step down. Um, uh, do you think we'll see reform become a proper party? I mean, I think they're polling at the moment somewhere in the kind of 10 to 15% mm. of range, which shows that there is there is a view out there that there is a need for a party. I think Richard Tice, who's leading uh, on reform, has done a good job of getting out on television and talking about the business, economy, the markets. He's someone who wants lower taxation, more investment in business, which is an old school conservatism that's been a little bit lost in the last mm, five or six years. We've not heard this kind of pro-business talk for a while. And look, if if one in eight, or sorry, one in ten or sort of two in ten people want to support that, and that's what the appetite seems to be, then if they're able to get representation in the House of Parliament, then they'll be able to do that. At the same time, it's sort of eight and ten people probably not going to be that swayed by that group, but they shouldn't be stopped from trying. But do, do you think, like they always say, there's the, the, there's the silent Tory voter that only sneaks out yeah. uh, during the election, ticks that box. Are there silent reform voters? Because I think um, since the days of, of Brexit and before that, um, uh, UKIP and all of that, there is a rising tension with as we just heard there with with unfettered immigration mm -hmm. uh with the numbers which we keep being promised will be in the tens of thousands that absolutely will never happen um you know the the, the boats that are coming across the um uh, you know which is the smallest actually concern in in terms of immigration but people are have had enough and this is why we're seeing across europe and across the world uh, more of a lean towards the right. I'm not going to say right wing, but certainly more of a uh, of a leaning towards right leaning policies, and we will see more and more of that. Yeah, the history across 
across time and also uh, across Europe and the world at the moment is that when you have a constrained economy, people tend to want to preserve resources more. And one of the ways of doing that is saying, well, we're not going to have more people than we already have. Well, it's, it's also a, the blame, isn't it? Yes. Uh, saying well, the reason we haven't got any money is because of them. It was very well employed in Nazi Germany. The reason we haven't got any money is because the Jews have got it. Uh, it. Here, it's the reason we haven't got any houses is because the immigrants have got it. Yeah. And so it's, the government want us to blame them because then we don't blame the government. Yeah, I think that's the as a kind of classic populist way mm. of doing it. It's very, very negative and it can lead to the sort of conflicts and arguments and hatred and, and, hatred and, and death yeah. threats that we're seeing right now. It's not to be encouraged in the slightest. I also think, though, that there is... Uh, an, an argument that's a reasonable political argument. It may not be one I would make, but there are people who will say when there are constrained resources, we should limit the population growth or we should only have certain types of population growth that we feel confident will help our economy and therefore we put the walls up and we don't allow immigration. And that's where I think Richard Tice is coming from. The downside of that approach is, well, what do you do about the fact that we have a really small working population uh, in the UK compared to the very large and and going to increase uh, older population and a very low birth rate at the moment. So we're not going to see huge swathes of people in 20 years time coming into the workforce because in fact there's not many children. So you may want to solve this by not having immigration but you're going to have to come up with a really good plan. He's saying he's going to do it by cutting taxes, by being pro-business but the last time a Prime Minister, which was Liz Truss, went down that route, the markets absolutely punished us as a country and we got massive inflation. Mm. So I think it's fair enough if he wants to go out on TV, if he can get people to vote for him, that is democracy. Whether I like it or not, he gets to have that debate. But we don't really have good evidence that it's going to work. And I think maybe it's going to push Labour a little bit to have to say what they think. And if they are going to uh, allow more immigration or if they are saying they're also going to withhold, you know, not have as much immigration, what's their plan? How are they going to stimulate the economy? Because mm. we do have to work out what we do about the fact we're going to have many older people and many fewer younger people. Right, let's take a quick break, um, but uh, we will be back with you, Laura and I, in just a moment, so don't go anywhere. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Oh, it's, bless him, he's soaking wet. Nice. The most likely situation is that that statue is going to end up in M Shed, which is a museum just on the harbour. Nick, I, when we first went to you, I thought you dived into the harbour to get the, get the thing out, for God's sake, man. Well done, good job. Islamism is sweeping our nation. This is not Islamophobia, this is real. Another terror attack, another killing of an MP. Oh, don't worry, let's light a candle, let's all sing, let's look, don't look back in anger and sing Kumbaya. He had a a uh, politically uh, minded project called WikiLeaks. It said yeah. nothing about what was going on in the Kremlin, nothing about what was going on in China. There was a clear political bias in what he was doing. This is the first time Millam has heard of asylum seekers coming to the town. If we are guinea pigs, then I, I think we should have been consulted. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Well, it will be a problem if they start breaking into people's homes because they can break into yours and decide that you're not doing enough. <laughs> they can break into mine and decide I'm not doing enough. And I'll tell you what, if they break into my home, it will get violent. That's for sure. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? You know? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, miss it. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put the statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> There are no banners calling for and the they will release not of the condemn, hostages. They will not there are no the banners, mass. Kevin. You can't say everyone on that march not, when no, it comes to the mass. Sorry, no, I, yeah. sorry, I've got, I've got you both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't. Good. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? What on earth 
is going on in the House of Commons? I'll try my very best to explain that, Daisy, but it is an extremely complicated situation. This just absolutely stinks. Right, Neil Parrish, he was great for his area. If Richard Soon actually brought him out today and said, this guy's going to be advised by a special right. counsel. If anybody can pull it off, it'll be him. Oh. <laughs> what? Oh. What? <laughs> Your <laughs> mind. <laughs> it's not our mind, it's your mouth, Mr. Unbelievable. Collins. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Hi, good afternoon. It's Petri here with you until four o'clock and I've got uh, Laura McInery, who's a journalist in the studio uh, with me. Uh, Laura, we're going to talk to Stuart Lewis now, who's founder and CEO of Rest Less UK, um, about pensions. Now, I saw this story, so, um, about whether pensioners should continue to pay national insurance if they're still working at pension age. Uh, let's talk to Stuart now. Stuart, um, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Petri. Pleasure to be here. It's great to see you. So, look, um, a lot of people uh, are saying, obviously, no pensioners have paid their bit, they've done their bit. Others saying, well, times have changed and we haven't got the money anymore. There's a growing population of pensioners, um, so they're going to have to pay a little bit more. And it's not like we're saying to, to tax them. We're basically saying that their employer will pay a substantial amount of national insurance and they might have to pay a little bit. So is it fair to ask them to do that? I think the, the idea of setting tax policy based off someone's age is rather peculiar. Uh, so kind of under the Equalities Act, age is a protected characteristic, just like gender, just like ethnicity. So we wouldn't be asking the question around, or society wouldn't be asking the question around, should we tax men or women more? Um, at Restless, we often talk about ageism as being the last socially acceptable form of prejudice. And it's a classic example of a uh, question society wouldn't be asking about any other protected characteristic. Yes, but, but, but we already do uh, tax differently according to age. I mean, it's, it's just the thing that we already do. What I'm saying is it's acceptable to continue doing that. It, yeah, well, as you say, the question we should be asking is always around what policies are being put forward. Um, and if you think about the specific uh, question around national insurance, so at the moment, state pensioners, so people who are old enough to qualify for the state pension, don't have to pay national insurance on their on their earnings, if that makes sense. Um, so we think that that is fair. If you think that the vast majority of the national insurance fund gets spent on the state pension, um, you also think pensioners have to actually work. They have to have 35 years of qualifying national insurance contributions to be able to be eligible for that state pension. And that was always the promise that they've had over the last last um, uh, decades of working. So the idea of suddenly changing that and, uh, and affecting only those who are still working beyond the state pension age, which actually isn't the most affluent of retirees, uh, those with generous defined benefit pensions or those who have but, but, a large Can I just interrupt there and say, look, you know, yeah. th these people will also be getting their pension uh, at the same time as working. Um, they, they haven't paid for their own pension. We know how this works. I'm, I'm paying at the moment for their pension. Uh, somebody younger than me is going to be paying for my pension. So things change, right? And we know the situation. We've got an, a growing ageing population. If somebody's already drawing a pension and working, what's wrong with them paying national insurance because that is saying that is a different tax policy because everybody else working is paying their national insurance pensioners have already got triple lock they've got you know they're probably more likely to be a home owners not all the time I appreciate there is poverty there but but if you're working why not pay and, and that's just it. So there's a lot of debate often around have the generation of retirees actually benefited to the detriment of, of younger cohorts of individuals. I think there's a, as you said, there's a hugely diverse group of people in here from very affluent retirees or business owners who are still working to those who are living hand to mouth. For us, when you think about tax as a method of incentive or dri driving behaviour, a lot's been said about actually we need more older workers. We need business to embrace more older workers with falling fertility rates, rising life expectancy. Actually, even if you took a to take away out any altruistic view of it, wouldn't we shouldn't we be trying to incentivize those type of older workers to work beyond state pension age? When to be honest, they could just leave the workforce, take all of their skills and knowledge with them, 
and actually not and take the state pension. But isn't it? that money better spent on incentivising those younger who have left the workplace, who are nowhere near pension age, to incentivise them into the workplace? They're going to be working for much longer. Uh, we have a, a, a fairly disastrous record of trying to get people off benefits and into work. Um, we should be using any cash we've got incentivising them, surely. Yeah, I think I think one of the debates when you think about retirement provision generally is often very black and white around the state pension and the 124, 125 billion pounds that that costs every year. I think when you, you look at the UK state pension relative to other developed nations and the OECD, actually the state pension is relatively ungenerous compared to other countries, but we're more generous with private pension provision, actually, which is where you allow uh, wealthier individuals to build up a, a pension pot of their own of their own making, if that makes sense. And that is often what encourages people or enables people to leave the workforce earlier. Um, and that's another 50 billion of uh, pension tax relief that the government spends on that every year. So there's, there's definitely ways to incentivize the right behavior. We think trying to tax or trying to change national insurance specifically for those working after the age of 66 is probably not the best way of moving the needle uh, and a being equitable about it, but encouraging those people to stay into the workforce. A lot of people, though, would say, "Well, look, why, I, I didn't even know they weren't paying it if they're earning, because I have to pay it and I'm earning." Um, and um, you know, if we're saying that they've paid in, then then they might need more NHS care. The NHS is desperate for money. They're the ones that are going to be using it, not my 26-year-old son who's paying through the teeth for his uh, national insurance contribution that he probably will never benefit from the way things are going. I'm barely likely to benefit myself as they move the pension age closer and closer to death. Um, you know, what's wrong with them paying now? And, and I think for me that comes down to all around how do we allocate and distribute tax wealth. Uh, for me using age and, and trying to, because age is so broad, if you think about the term pensioner, uh, for some that conjures up the image of a 95 year old in a care home, for others, it conjures up the image of a 60-year-old on the south in the on the yacht in the south of France. Um, you wouldn't talk about a worker as a collective group because it's just so broad and diverse. And I think we need to think more nuanced around how do we think about pensioners and therefore which pockets and where where equity can be found in terms of tax policy. I'll tell you what, the BBC used to refer to me as a worker. Made me feel like I was a sex worker, uh, to be perfectly honest. Uh, listen, great to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Stuart Lewis, their founder and CEO of Rest Less UK. Uh, what do you make of this? Because it, it, it is undoubted when we look at the pension age now, the best has gone, right? We know that uh, governments now are looking at moving the pension age to 70 or mm -hmm. 71. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're going to be chasing that, right? Yeah. We, we, we're going to go, oh, next year, no, oh, damn it. So we're going to miss that. Um, meanwhile, the, the youngsters, 26 year olds, mm -hmm. can't, can barely afford rent, can't get on the housing ladder, and they're paying through the teeth on national insurance and all other taxation um, to, to the point where they're practically broke every month. Um, it, it seems unfair that if you're drawing a pension and working, you shouldn't at least pay your national insurance. I think this is because we've set national insurance up as a particular type of fund, which it isn't. So we've sort it's of pretend, taxation. Yeah, we've, we've double sort taxation, of pretended it? that it's a separate thing. And if as long as you put in for so many years, then you're entitled to this thing on the other side. That's the game that we set up at the beginning. And of course, if you're currently retired or on the edge of retirement, you feel like you've played that game correctly and all of the money available for your NHS, your social care, has your pension, been paid, but it hasn't. should be there. Yeah, yeah it and isn't. it turns out we didn't save enough. Now, it's really difficult then if lots of people in that group are not working to ask for more from them. So, of course, you want to say to the ones so who are still working. we will be paying half of that, yeah, right? Of, yes. Well, they'll be paying a separate national insurance yeah. amount and then you pay national insurance yeah. as well. But I can also see that if you've sort of paid it all off and you're now earning out of it, it's a bit silly to keep putting in for it because you've already done your 30-odd years. So that's why you're able to take your pension and not pay in any more because that pension's only going to be a fixed amount if it was that way round but it isn't is it because we know that paying your pension it's not like a um i'm putting money in a bank account for me right now i'm paying 
for them. And that's because why... there isn't any money. There is no money to pay that isn't right. coming in now. And right? that's why I think this whole national insurance thing, to be honest, we could really do with getting rid of it. We could simplify an awful lot if what we did is we said there is an income tax. This is the tax on your income. Mm. This is what your employer has to pay. And in fact, it isn't going to necessarily buy you all of these things in retirement. There are provisions that you will yes, need to make and we can change, move on. Right? Yeah. Things change. The NHS is on its knees. The country is practically just about on its knees. Um, you might have to pay if you're working, if you're not working, if you're truly retired and you're on the golf course or you're, you're, you're doing some, I don't know, painting or crocheting or whatever it is you choose to do, this won't affect you. It mm. will only affect those of you who are working. And, and if you're, you know, if there's people say, well, look, there's poverty and they're earning very little, mm -hmm. well, they won't pay it anyway. It'll only be those who are earning, you know, over that limit mm -hmm. that pay that national insurance. And if you have to, because there's already separate taxation for uh, pensioners, you say, right, well, they don't pay, start paying national insurance until it's £15,000 a year. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not, I, I don't see that it's beyond the wit of man to figure that out. It's not. It's already separate. So it, It's definitely doable. The question is more, will it encourage some people who we want to keep in the workforce because we don't have enough people in the workforce to leave, which essentially means what we're doing is we're giving a tax break to a bunch of people, to old people in order to carry on are, working. Who are, who are already you know doing okay, most lots of them being able to buy houses for next to nothing not all of them i appreciate that but you know it, it seems the wrong way around to me a lot of this incentivize young people into the workplace there's enough of them not doing it yes and that's it. and then we have to think about who 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 should get those tax breaks i just think for this particular one it's, it's quite a technical loophole if you like mm. i can understand why certain groups particularly those who are low income are against it i do think there's a group will lose out of the workforce and so for me would i spend time on closing this loophole probably not i would instead want to look again at um national insurance being separate as a whole issue put it all together and redo the tax reform for the reasons that you talked about which is that your son is likely paying a very high level of tax there are certain groups in the working age population mm. who have huge marginal tax rates particularly if they need childcare and particularly if they have student loans some of them are on 80 percent marginal tax rates you know that Outrageous. is what we've got to be trying to yeah. resolve and i wouldn't be spending parliamentary time potentially stopping somebody from uh, I don't know, carrying on two days a week in their job into their 70s, which is good for their well-being, good for society. Yeah, but you just to set try the and limit. I mean, they're not likely to be earning, you know, 100 grand a year doing that, possibly, I, I, but, but unlikely. And, and uh, you know, just set... The, it's already different. Make it different, but if for those people who are wealthy... Say, so, look, I'm sorry, you're going to have to continue paying your national insurance. Well, I think there's definitely more we could do as well to try and look at if people are in good positions, is there other taxes that you could do? But then you get into mm. super unpopular territory as a politician. Super unpopular. Um, I know because uh, because they're, you know, pensioners, I'm sorry, they believe that they're, you know, un completely untouchable. But when there's there's the country's in a mess, everybody has to dig in, right? Hate me. Uh, let's talk to Martin, who's in Denbyshire. Martin. Hello. How are you, Patrick? Hi there. You wanted to mention the MPs. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that now the... Uh, I think British politics is in such a state that, um, you know, <laughs> it's becoming a laughing matter. Uh, I, 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 my feeling with Lee Anderson is I don't think that he's Islamophobic. I think that what he's doing, he's pointing out the situation that... Uh, MPs in the past have got us into now, uh, like you, one of your previous uh, callers said, you know, we've allowed everybody into the country, we've done little checks on people, and um, MPs over the past have just, you know, got, run, gone with the flow to protect the pensions, to protect everything else, and not thought about the consequences. And, uh, you know, we've got a situation now where we've got a lot of young men coming into this country, they're being dispersed all over the country. Uh, they are fodder for extremists, and God forbid it ever happened, but it's, it's a silent army that's stuck away. And when you consider that a lot of these young, fit, healthy men have run away from their countries and left very strong women to fight for rights in their countries because the men are too, too weak and run away, 
Um, and well, they they're often like outliers, aren't they? They're, they're coming here to say that they can move those women uh, and, and families across at yeah. some point looking for a better world. And I, you know, it'd be naive of me not to recognise the, the people you're talking about, but also let's remember that that is a minority. Yeah. Um, well, as yet to be proved any other way, and if you can prove it to me, then I'll eat my words. But, but there hasn't been those terror attacks, there hasn't been those threats that we've been hearing about uh, that are going to happen, or you let this arm in so you know and I know we, we need to stop it before it happens if it happens Absolutely. but there is there is still no no evidence really from security services that that is what is happening but we've got a situation now with the police I mean I grew up a policeman's son and you know the, the Metropolitan Police have a lot to answer for and quite rightly what you pointed out you know displaying a slogan on a public building. Oh, it's an absolute disgrace. Place. I don't know how. I don't know how that was even a allowed uh, to happen. Listen, Martin, good to talk to you. I've got to go because we've completely run out of time uh, and I wanted to have time to say thank you very much indeed to Laura. Thank, thank you, you very much indeed for coming in. Laura McKinnery, there, journalist. Uh, and to say to you that coming up, we're going to be talking about the uh, borrowing money to buy a car. You want to stay and listen to this because you could be in for a payout. You could be somebody who's going to get thousands from the bank. This is Talk TV. This, my friends, is Talk Today with me, Jeremy Kyle. And me, Nicola Thorpe. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Oh, it's, bless him, he's soaking wet. Nice. The most likely situation is that that statue is going to end up in M Shed, which is a museum just on the harbour. Nick, I, when we first went to you, I thought you dived into the harbour to get the, get the thing out, for God's sake, man. Well done, good job. Islamism is sweeping our nation. This is not Islamophobia, this is real. Another terror attack, another killing of an MP. Oh, don't worry, let's light a candle, let's all sing, let's look, don't look back in anger and sing Kumbaya. He had a a uh, politically uh, minded project called WikiLeaks. It said yeah. nothing about what was going on in the Kremlin, nothing about what was going on in China. There was a clear political bias in what he was doing. This is the first time Millam has heard of asylum seekers coming to the town. If we are guinea pigs, then I, I think we should have been consulted. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Well, it will be a problem if they start breaking into people's homes because they can break into yours and decide that you're not doing enough. <laughs> they can break into mine and decide I'm not doing enough. And I'll tell you what, if they break into my home, it will get violent, that's for sure. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? <laughs> What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, miss it. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> There are no banners calling for and the release of the condemn, hostages. They will not there are no Hamas. banners, Kevin. You can't say everyone on that march when we can't say Hamas. Hamas. Sorry, no, I'm yeah. sorry, I've got, I've got you both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you no, can't. Good. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? What on earth? is going on in the House of Commons. I'll try my very best to explain that, Daisy, but it is an extremely complicated situation. This just absolutely stinks. Right, Neil Parrish, he was great for his area. Richard Soon actually brought him out today and said, this guy's going to be advising you on a special case. Right. If anybody can pull it off, it'll be him. Oh. <laughs> what? Oh. What? <laughs> my your mind. <laughs> it's not our minds, it's your mouth, Mr. Unbelievable. Collins. Unbelievable. Yeah. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth.
Look, I'm getting ready for my new primetime show on talk TV and radio, 7 o'clock Saturday night, James Whale Unleash. I don't need you coming in here, following me around with a cow. I'm so sorry about this. Saturdays at 7 on talk TV. Hello, good afternoon. It's Petri here with you until four o'clock this Sunday, the 25th of February. And uh, coming up in the next um, hour or so, we're going to be talking about men wearing makeup. And I want to hear from you um, because I know you do. I know you do. Come on. There's no shame in it. Um, a lot of men now are wearing makeup. They're wearing foundation. They're wearing a little bit of mascara, clear mascara. So I hear, so I understand. And who doesn't steal their girlfriends or their wife's stuff? Come on, the creams and the moisturizers and all of that that's going on. Uh, I'm sure you do. So I'd love to hear from you if you are a man who's, who's man enough to admit that he wears makeup. So give me a call, 0344 499 uh, 1000. We're also going to be talking about um, people who have wild animals living in their houses and i'm not talking about wild human animals i'm talking about lions or tigers perhaps not bears but uh, oh my do they live next door to you give me a call 0344 499 1000 uh, any advice anybody lives in shepherd's bush keep away from a little black and white cat though she's vicious she doesn't have to be a tiger vicious She's called Miss Edith, and she is, she's my cat. Awful creature, horrible. Um, she's very, very scary. But um, um, now, though, you're going to want to find out about this, because have you ever taken out a loan to buy a car? Many cars that we see on the roads today are financed, and there's nothing wrong with that. But what interest rate did you borrow that money on? And you're probably looking at me and going, what's she talking about? It's just the interest rate they gave me. Well, did you know that the people selling those loans were able to make up their own interest rates? Lloyds Bank now has set aside £450 million for the claims that are going to start coming in. So have a think about the car that you borrowed money for and how much you paid on your interest rate. We'll find out more about this. I mean, this is the new PPI, isn't it? This is people going, right, I'm going to get some money back out of this. Uh, Stuart Mason joins me now, who's uh, editor of The Car Expert. Uh, hi, Stuart. Good afternoon, Petri. How are you? Good afternoon. I'm well. Look, this is... I mean, I, 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 when I was reading the details of this, I thought, how on earth did they get away with... Who thought this was a good idea? Well... It, the, these, these types of agreements are what's known as a discretionary credit arrangement. And on certain types of car finance, the dealers were able to manipulate the interest rate that was being offered by the bank. About three years ago, the, the Financial Conduct Authority said, right, this is, we're going to ban this, this is not acceptable anymore. Um, but since then, uh, it had been legal for, for decades, um, but since that these types of finance agreements were banned. There have been thousands of complaints about them, um, and that's now brought the issue to a head, and it could be that there ends up being um, some significant compensation being paid. So it is like the PPI, in other words. These are, these are people who, who were missold, that they, 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 these people could make up the interest. It, albeit a while ago, I still can't believe it was practised, it was believed... Uh, to be reasonable even at the time they must have known this was wrong yeah i mean car finance is is kind of complex at the best of times because you go and buy a car from a dealer who is acting on behalf of a manufacturer they're also acting on behalf of the finance company so they arrange the finance through the finance company for you but for some reason it was considered acceptable that that in certain cases and it's certainly not on every car finance agreement um, but on plenty of car finance agreements, the dealer was able to manipulate the interest rate that the bank had already approved for the customer. So rather than saying, right, Petri, you know, the bank might have said, yes, we'll loan you the money at 7%, but the dealer was able to open a hidden system and, and up that to maybe 12%. And who got the difference? Uh, the dealers were getting additional commission because they get the dealer gets commission for arranging finance, as does any broker, and that's perfectly normal. But they were getting more commission 
from the lender, from the bank, if they charged more interest. So they were being rewarded for making the customers borrowing more expensive. And of course, the bank was also profiting from this as well. I mean, that is outrageous. <laughs> I, is it just me? What? I'm so shocked by this. I'm so shocked that this was even, this was ever, a, I mean, the, the, the bank knowingly was saying to to the car dealers, if you look, you, we, we'll give you seven percent. This is this is the go, don't go beyond that. Don't go below that. If you get any higher than that, we'll give we'll give you a bit of a kickback. I mean, it's so it, dodgy. It, there, there were reasons for it. And part of the reasoning was that, 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 that it gave the, the dealers opportunity to present a package to the customer based on what they were looking for, how much deposit they wanted to put in, how much they wanted to spend per month. And that, that because the customer couldn't talk directly to the lender, they were always going through the, the dealer, um, that the dealer had the opportunity to help. The idea was that they could bring the rate down as well as up. Um, in practice, they only went up. Up, um, of course. Rather than down. Yeah. So... Um, it, it, the question it was it was legal but in terms of how it was being used and and any kind of finance regardless of of, of the legality but it, it's always a question of how it's being sold and how it's being used doesn't matter whether it's car finance a credit card a payday yeah, I mean, loan presumably the, the way it's being sold is as important as the type of product yeah so presumably had the dealer said look if you want to go straight to the bank to get this loan it'll cost you seven percent which we're making these numbers up right yep. but if if you if you take the loan through me it'll be 12 percent. that would have been honest but presumably people weren't Correct. given that option no, and with, with most car finance that's arranged through a dealer, you don't have the opportunity to go and talk directly to the lender. Right. It's all arranged through, it's called captive finance because it's done on in the showroom, it's done um, at the dealership and the dealer brokers the finance on your behalf as the customer with their lender. So it's a bit different from a, sort of a mortgage broker who will go out to a whole panel of lenders and mm. see what they can get for you. Often the car deal will only be working with one or two lenders that they will actually ever ever deal with and they'll tend to deal with whoever gives them the best commission not necessarily who's giving the customer the best deal and lloyd's bank uh, particularly um uh, was involved in this and and they're saying there's significant uncertainty over liability amid these um these car financing um loans but they've been forced to put aside 450 million but it could end up costing lloyd's two billion it depends on what the financial conduct authority decides to do so what happened was um there had been thousands of complaints that came in from car owners or, or customers to the finance company so lloyd's is one of them through their their black horse uh, car finance division there was barclays there was motor novo there was close brothers there were many 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 of them um and the finance companies all said no 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 you've got no reason to complain we've done nothing wrong a few customers took their cases to the motor ombudsman or to the finance ombudsman and recently on two perfectly run-of-the-mill car finance examples the finance ombudsman decided in favor of the customer to the tune of a thousand pounds or so that the, the they forced the the finance company to pay compensation to the customer and because they were perfectly normal examples that's now sort of essentially set a precedent where the claims management companies and class action companies could suddenly potentially launch huge actions against every lender that offered these types of finance agreements. So what the regulator has said is, okay, everybody stop. We're going to look into the whole issue across the industry and decide whether or not this is an industry-wide problem that we will then issue you know, a blanket compensation for, or if we decide, no, it's, it's specific examples and that the, the normal processes should follow. So they're going to take until about September to try and, and work this out. And then they will issue their decision as to whether or not there is going to be a PPI style compensation for everyone that had one of these types of agreements or whether they will push it back and say, no, it's not an industry problem. If you've got a problem, take it up with the ombudsman or take it to court. How would you know if you had been missold at one of these, these uh, loans? Okay, so firstly, it's important that the types of car finance agreement that had this would generally be either a PCP, personal contract purchase, or an HP hire purchase, potentially a, a lease purchase, uh, a conditional sale. Um, but they're all they're all types of car finance sold through dealers. It doesn't involve leasing, which is rental. It doesn't involve things like subscriptions. It doesn't involve personal loans from a bank. So if it's a if it's a car finance deal, normally what's called a secured car finance against the car. Um, 
if you don't know whether you had one, and you probably won't, then you can contact the lender, the finance company that lent you the money, which is not the dealer you bought the car from, but the lender who actually lent you the money. You can contact them either writing, uh, in writing or on the phone. Writing's always better, so you've got a written record, and actually ask whether or not you did, and they're obliged to tell you whether or not you had one of these arrangements on your on your agreement. And, and, and you, if you find out you do have one of those arrangements on your agreement, do you then go to the ombudsman about it or do you sit and wait until September and see what happens? At the moment, yes, the FCA has paused the complaints process, so you can't complain and seek compensation right now. You can pop a complaint in, but no one's obliged to answer you. So what will happen is that in September, the FCA will decide whether or not there's going to be an overall industry-wide solution for compensation or whether or not you are basically obliged to, to follow your own process, either get a lawyer, go to the ombudsman or join a class action. So if the, if the FCI decides it's an industry-wide problem, it will put in place a process. So you'll be able to go through that process and make a claim, and then assuming that's all approved, you'll, you'll get your money. If they decide that it's a specific issue for specific lenders, then you will have to follow your own process. How many people are likely to have been missold, in your estimation? It's a difficult question because we are talking potentially millions and millions of car finance agreements, but not it's not necessarily the case that every car finance agreement that had a discretionary um, commission arrangement was disadvantaging the customer because the dealer didn't necessarily bump the, 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 the interest rate up. It, they might have felt that if the customer was already at the limit from what they could afford, there was no point putting the interest rate up and making their payments dearer because they wouldn't be able to afford it. So as essentially it will depend. And we don't really know, as you said, Lloyd's have set aside 450 million pounds, which they have to do really because they know this investigation's underway. Regardless of what the FCA decides, there's going to be a lot of claiming for compensation from the bank, so they need to have that money set aside for when that day comes. Um, but it, until we really know what the FCA decides and what the threshold they consider to be for compensation, we don't really know how many people are likely to be eligible and how many cases are likely to be. It's more likely to be used car finance than new car finance. New car finance is often sold on an advertised rate, a promotional rate. Before the pandemic, it was there were lots of 0% interest rate um, deals on offer from car dealers uh, through the finance companies for new cars. So used cars tends to be far more free market, whatever they thought they could get away with. So um, it's more likely to be used cars than new cars, but there will be some new car deals as well. Uh, I've just had a message come through saying, is there a time limit uh, for the age of the car on these? No, no, there's no age limit on the car. So, as I said, most of them will be used. Um, the majority of the cars are likely, to, when they were bought, were likely to be less than five years old because those are the sorts of cars where people tend to be borrowing from the dealer um, or cars that are more than, say, £10,000 or so. If you're borrowing much less money than that, people still tend to go to their local bank and get a personal loan or pay it out of their savings or even use a credit card. So chances are, I mean, the average used car borrowing is £10,000. The average new car borrowing is about £25,000. Um, so that's the sort of numbers we're talking about. If you're buying a car that was only a few thousand pounds, chances are it probably wasn't one of these sorts of agreements. OK. Um, uh, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about, if you don't mind, is I was reading the papers uh, today and, and there was a piece suggesting that, peop that young people are being priced out of driving um, in terms of the... Uh, the cost of taking the test and then the cost of uh, insuring your car uh, and, and even things like financing to get a, de a, a decent car. Um, not to mention, of course, there are many people being priced out of driving who live in London or who live in a city where they're now applying all these extra taxes and, and costs to driving. What's happening? Are we, ever, are we going to go back to the days when only rich people could drive and poor people had to just watch them go past? It's certainly getting a lot more expensive and young people, as they always tend to do with driving, tend to bear the brunt of that the most. Getting insurance for young drivers is very, very expensive. <clears throat> the price of, of new cars has gone up quite a lot over the last five years or so. Uh, during the pandemic time, the price of used cars shot up um, because there were real supply problems on, on new cars. So more people were buying used cars, which drove the price up. Um, interest rates have gone up, so borrowing money to buy a car has become more expensive. People have got less disposable income um, due to cost of living increases. Um, the cost of petrol is slowly, steadily going up over time. Mm. Um, so, yeah, the, the costs of, of running a car are getting more expensive 
for everyone, but inevitably young people tend to bear the burden of that. And, and you know, particularly with um, things like the ULEZ, uh, we, we saw that in London where there's a lot of people who, who are not at the wealthier end of the spectrum, who have old cars, perfectly reasonable old cars, um, who, who have had to get rid of them. Uh, and they can't afford to replace it with one of the, even with a grant that you're unlikely to get anyway, um, they can't afford to replace it with the kind of car that we're being told is, is acceptable. Yeah, that's right. I mean, ULES, the, the extension to ULES to basically cover everywhere in the M25 was, frankly, the wrong tool and the wrong job. But it it, I'm was, sure it's it was bring in brutal. Lots, of, lots was... and lots of money to Sadiq Khan. But yeah. um, in terms of actually benefiting the environment, benefiting the residents of London and the people who are maybe live and work outside London that need to come in, um, it's been ridiculously terrible. Um, but unfortunately, there's not much we can do about that now. But um, it was a it was the wrong tactic and it's it's hurting the wrong people um and the reality is it's not going to help the environment and, and polar bears and, and small children much at all but we've also got a situation now haven't we where it's very very popular to say right um it, you know in five years time you can only buy an electric car no one can afford an electric car who can afford an electric car and if you are buying a second hand one you're going to have to buy a new battery which is again prohibitively expensive at the moment no so, no um Car batteries, the, the expectation is that the, the battery will outlast the car in most okay. situations. All right. Yeah, that's, um, that's going to be less of an issue. But new. nine out of 10 households buy used cars, not new cars. So there are roughly 10 million cars and vans sold in the UK every year. Two million of those are new, and more than half of those are fleets. So it's less than a million people a year buy new cars, uh, households. Nine out of 10 of us buy used cars. Now, a used car could be six months old, or it could be 20 years old. But it will filter through, so the price of electric cars has been falling steadily over the last year. That's going to continue to happen. By the time anyone's forced to buy an electric car because they're simply not offering petrol cars anymore, the prices will have come down dramatically. But that's still a decade away or more yeah. by the time um, that most people are actually in the point where they, they really have no choice. And will it ever be a case that there will be the, the, the split between the rich and the poor being able to afford to drive, to park, to... Would you think that? Oh, sorry, you just yeah. disappeared for a minute. Yeah. The, the, the... Um, it, it, it's getting much harder for, for average families to be able to afford to drive because of all those costs, parking, tax. Um, the amount of tax we pay on petrol is enormous. And as we shift from petrol cars to electric cars, they're going to have to rethink that. So we're going to look at, we're going to see road pricing, toll roads everywhere because um, you don't pay you know, half your, your, your fuel cost in tax. So mm. that's all going to happen. So the, it is getting much, much harder um, so it remains to be seen whether or not the price of, of driving is ever going to come back down, but it certainly doesn't look like it for the foreseeable future. Good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Stuart Masson there, who's editor of The Car Expert. So let me know, have you taken out one of these loans? Do you think you were missold? 0344 499 1000. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Oh, it's, bless him, he's soaking wet. Nice. The most likely situation is that that statue is going to end up in M Shed, which is a museum just on the harbour. Nick, I, when we first went to you, I thought you dived into the harbour to get the, get the thing out, for God's sake, man. Well done, good job. Islamism is sweeping our nation. This is not Islamophobia, this is real. Another terror attack, another killing of an MP. Oh, don't worry, let's light a candle, let's all sing, let's look, don't look back in anger and sing Kumbaya. He had a, a politically uh, minded project called WikiLeaks, which said nothing about what was going on in the Kremlin, nothing about what was going on in China. There was a clear political bias in what he was doing. This is the first time Millam has heard of asylum seekers coming to the town. If we are guinea pigs, then I, I think we should have been consulted. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Well, it will be a problem if they start breaking into people's homes because they can break into yours and decide that you're not doing enough. <laughs> they can break into mine and decide I'm not doing enough. And I'll tell you what, if they break into my home, it will get violent, that's for sure. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. 
couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, <is it? laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> There are no banners calling for the re release of the condemn, hostages. They will not there are no banners, mass. Kevin. You can't say everyone on that march when it comes to the mass. Sorry, no, I'm yeah. sorry, I've got, I've got you both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you no, can't. Good. I'm, no, so, I'm sorry. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? What on earth? is going on in the House of Commons. I'll try my very best to explain that, Daisy, but it is an extremely complicated situation. This just absolutely stinks. Right. Neil Parrish, he was great for his area. Rishi Sunak actually brought him out today and said, this guy's going to be advised yeah, by a special case. If anybody can pull it off, it'll be him. Oh. <laughs> what? Oh. What? <laughs> your your mind. <laughs> it's not our mind, it's your mouth, Mr. Unbelievable. Collins. Unbelievable. Yeah. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. Hi, good afternoon. It's Petri here with you until four o'clock. And um, we've been talking about the loans that you may have got to buy your car um, and that you may well have been missold. Have you found that you were missold? Basically, the dealers could exaggerate the interest rate to whatever they thought you could pay um, with full knowledge of the banks. So. I, I literally can't believe that that was a thing, but it was a thing. It's now illegal, but it was a thing. Um, so the banks, quite rightly, uh, are having to put money aside. Lloyds particularly has put aside 450 million, although it could be as much as two billion pounds in mis-selling. So um, give me a call if you think you were one of those people who was missold. 0344. 499-1000. We're also still talking about MPs having to have security uh, and having to have bodyguards and chauffeur-driven cars that, that we're paying for, by the way, um, because they don't feel safe. They don't feel that they can uh, go about their daily lives without threat um, of violence against them. So um, give me a call about that as well. Now, though, are you man enough to admit that you wear makeup? Are you? Nothing wrong with it. Makeup is the best thing that was ever invented. I'm always said, thank goodness for makeup. Otherwise, my career would only be radio, uh, for, for, and it would have been my entire career. So, thank goodness for makeup. Um, do you ever wear it? Is this something that that only young men, Gen Z, Z? Uh, where um, is this something that older men will wear? Because you do wear it. Come on, admit it. If you, your missus has got a bit of foundation there, do you not just, oh, I've got a bit of a spot, I'll put a bit of foundation on. Um, be man enough to admit you wear makeup. Give me a call, please. 0344 499 I think makeup's brilliant. I think everybody should wear it. But Robin James, who's founder of Every Man for Himself blog, joins me now. Um, Robin, a very good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm very well indeed, thank you. Uh, more and more men are wearing makeup. More and more men are taking more care of their skin. And in fact, people like L'Oreal, there are others, um, have have realise that there is a lot of money to be made in this. So there's men's face creams. I mean, I know, because I buy them for my son. You know, beard creams, um, all sorts of stuff. Um, but makeup, are men going to admit to wearing makeup? It's a it's a tricky one. As you said, you know, the, the grooming market is massive. You know, mm. by 2028, 2020, 2028, they're saying it's going to be worth 115 billion globally, which is up from 80 billion in 2022. And makeup is just one part of that market but as men they have more choices and more things that they can experiment in 
makeup is starting to come in. I mean, I see it through my channel, Man For Himself on YouTube and also from my blog. You know, guys are exploring these things and seeing what's out there. Also, as you're showing, you know, these pictures, Obati is a, is a new brand and they're really capitalizing on guys who are up for trying things. But admitting to makeup, I think, is a completely different thing. There's two camps, ones where guys want to kind of conceal and make the most of what they have and other guys who might be using it as a sort of creative outlet. I think looking at the uh, the sort of concealing and boosting what you have, the whole point of that is that you don't see it. So it is a case of maybe not admitting to it. Yeah, it, it is an interesting one because I've got I've got um, a, 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 a disproportionately large number of gay male friends. I mean, it's ridiculous, um, and and some of those will wear make. I mean, there's one of them, uh, Timmy, who I always say. Uh, fancy putting some makeup on, dear, because he's it's it's like this thick. It's but he doesn't care, right? He's going yes, but I look beautiful, um, and he does, right? He, uh, but that's not to feminise himself. That is just an over application of makeup. But I do know that other men will use clear mascara. I can see it, right? It's not it's not invisible, um, and and I think well, why not? And surely men, it's not. Femin it, 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 if you use it to feminize yourself, that's absolutely mm. fine. But if you if you just use it to, like you say, improve what, on what you have, then why is there such shame around it? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, gay or straight. I mean, if you're a straight man, you want to feminize yourself, whatever that whatever. looks like. Yeah. Then, then, then go for it. I think sexuality really doesn't have anything to do with makeup or skincare. You know, we all have skin. Um, but kind of just having again the options and the choices. We are living in a world where men can do as as they please and be whoever they want to. So makeup can just be a tiny part of that. I think it's interesting. You know, in shaving, we all get those little sort of red nicks on our neck. Using something which is counteractive, like something that is I've got here, like green, will just go against that red. Whereas, you know, some guys will be using mascara or they will be using, you know, heavy foundation or concealer. But, um, yeah, it's great to have the option. And, and but is it is it in the buying of it that where because people I suppose you can buy it on online now right but is it in the buying of it and I do notice that the the companies that are making male um, mm. uh, makeup that they the kind of masculine style wrapping or products or whatever I mean it, it's all a bit weird to me to uh, masculine <laughs> and feminine but but they will try and go no it's masculine to buy this stuff. Yeah, I mean, we've seen that, you know, Tom Ford Beauty did a whole men's makeup line, uh, Boy de Chanel, and they've all been in this sort of like black packaging. I mean, they've got some here, like oh, war sure. paint. It's all this sort of hyper-masculine. The new one, Obate, is is in this silver. So they are kind of, they're the same products within it. You know, if you look at sort of products that are marketed towards women, it's really the same stuff in there, but they're just in these real sort of like industrial packages. And are men, therefore, who do buy these concealers and buy these things, are they paying more? I mean, it's like with women and uh, I don't remember this, this, this thing about women's razors because they were pink. Mm -hmm. was something like 40% more expensive than men's razors. And I think we'll just buy a man's razor. Um, you know, are men paying more for their makeup than they, they would if they bought women's makeup? Yeah, well, they certainly were. I think even in the space of, I mean, I've had my channel, my blog for over 10 years and when the men's makeup thing started coming in with some of those mass markets it was at a premium you know we were looking at sort of 40 pounds for something very simple whereas now as we're getting sort of more accustomed to seeing men's makeup smaller uh sort of uh, price points are coming in with brands like revolution and ones that you'd be seeing in the likes of a boots or a super drug so it's not so much but yet i do think there's still a bit of a premium attached to to men's makeup products when when is it do you think going to happen that the men will say yes yeah, so what I, I i wear a bit of makeup because i remember i was at a different station and i did a phone in on this specifically just on this and i had so many men ringing up uh you know people who worked on building sites people who were drivers people who were uh, all these very tough masculine type mm -hmm. uh, figures who said well yeah i don't buy my own makeup but yeah i'll sneak a bit of sneak a bit of the missus, why not? Um, so I, I, I thought then, oh good, men are sort of coming around to this. Because makeup's brilliant, right? It's fantastic. It hides a whole host of sins. Yeah. Um, and and I, I just, I pray to the makeup gods every day. But I just think it's a shame that men 
if, if you look like that, that's how you're going to stay. You're not going to enhance it. Yeah, I, I mean, I think a lot of guys will kind of get into that makeup world when it comes to big events. So if they're getting married and they just want something that is going to take off the shine, like, Day to day, I wouldn't be wearing makeup. I kind of, I don't even do my hair if I'm just sat at a desk. <laughs> but if I've got something where I know that I'm going to be filming, like I have a light here, I've got some natural light here, I know that I'm going to get a bit of shine on, on my face. I used a tiny bit of powder, which is translucent. You can't even see it. It's just straight across and it takes the shine off. So I feel like, you know, as people are, you know, spending more on weddings and having photographers and videographers and someone's got a makeup artist and someone just says, well, let's try a little bit of something on you because, you know, big celebrities and footballers who are on a red carpet, they've got stuff all over their skin, you know, and it's, we don't talk about it so much because we don't see it. And that's the point of it. You know, yeah. it is both undetectable. Yeah, and it's interesting when when uh, I'm in the makeup room here, um, and the guys that that come through, I never hear one of them saying, "Oh no, don't put don't put too yeah. much on." Is they're always going, "Oh, can you just do a, a little bit more here and 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 zhuzh up my hair a bit?" And it's just kind of like, okay, so men are feeling more free to to say that they want to to zhuzh up. I think also, you know, at that point, someone else is saying, "I've got something for you that's going to help with those." Mm. Under bags or if we move your hair slightly it's going to cover some of those areas that might be thinning and I think when someone sort of delays them it becomes more accessible mm. so they might go home and say oh, do you know what? I tried a bit of that and then they go into even you know a Tesco and they see in sort of a makeup bit and they think oh I saw that on my skin maybe I should try yeah. that yeah unless someone tries something they don't know what's going to do what would you reckon when you go out for example to something yeah. in the evening what what would you wear makeup wise <laughs> I mean, I feel the older I've got, the more comfortable I am with my skin. So I tend not to use as much. Yeah. But if someone was looking to say, do you know what, I want to try a bit of a bit of something, then a tinted moisturiser is a great way to go. Really, it's just your usual moisturiser and it's got just the tiniest bit of colour in it. And it just means it's going to pick up your skin. It's going to even that skin tone, give you a bit of brightness. That's a super simple thing. Or like a concealer pen, I'm going to show you one here. Something like this looks like a lip balm, stick it in your bag, in your gym bag. It's got a tiny bit of colour, but it means under the eyes, just tap it on. It's going to take away any of that sort of purple or any of those shaving nicks. Those are the kind of the, the two most simple things, I would say. That, that, that's your gateway. That's the gateway. <laughs> <straight into it. laughs> that's the gateway. I'm, I'm in tinted moisturiser. That's all I'll wear at, 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 when I'm yeah. out, uh, out of the studio because it's, it's just easy and I don't, I don't particularly want to wear a full face the whole time. Um, Robin, thank you so much. You're, you. too, you're far too beautiful to need any makeup anyway. But Robin James, there, founder, Every Man for Himself blog. So do check that out. Um, so listen, if you if you are a man who wears makeup, come on, give me a call. Go on, you know you want to. Oh uh, three four 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 nine nine one thousand. I for one will support you. I think. Well, why not? I mean, I've been out with some. Dodgy looking blokes. A bit of makeup might have helped. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> so <laughs> give me a call if that's the case. Oh, they have been dodgy too. Simon? Simon, are you in. Hello, Simon, are you in Basingstoke? Yeah, hello, Petrie. Sorry. Hi. About that. That's all right. Hi. Would you ever wear makeup, Simon? No, I wouldn't. Oh. You can't improve on perfection. Petrie, oh, that so, is uh... the bre That is the most brilliant answer to that. Well done. That's well done. All right, Simon, so um, you wanted to talk about the state of our country and MPs. Yes, I did. I, th I think that uh, I think it's uh, something it, it, it all connects to what one of the some of the stuff you've been speaking about after that, when you're asking the, the expert about whether poor people will be able to afford to actually have cars in mm. the future. We're literally seeing uh, an ongoing decline in our living standards not just in the UK, throughout the West. And you also talked about popularism. Um, I always thought popularism was a good thing in a democracy. It's what the people want, not the elite that run the country. Mm. And if you look at the mass migration that we've had in the last 20 years, which has been 10 times higher than the normal levels of migration prior to 2004, um, how has it benefited the people in this country? I would say it hasn't. It certainly hasn't ba benefited the economy. And it's a short-term solution for uh, lower birth rates. 
that should be addressed in other ways. Like, for instance, your son, 26 year, years old. Um, I was working out the other day. I, I, my first job was in 1990. Uh, I earned 19,000 pounds. Taking inflation at 2%, the starting salary should be almost forty thousand pounds for a for a graduate. Did your son earn anything like that in his first job? No. No, absolutely not. Um, yeah, I mean, look, uh, look. Undoubtedly, some migration has been good for our economy. That that is pretty. You can't really argue uh, that because uh, we have got a, a, you know declining birth rate. We've got declining number of people in this country who are of the working age who are prepared to do that or who can do that. Um, and so we have had to have some immigration. But I do agree that it has been. It certainly seems to have been uncontrolled, unfettered, and un, 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 un badly judged. Um, uh, so far, but what is the answer to the birth rate? Well, I think the answer to the birth rate is you need to uh, incentivise it, so bring back things like the marriage allowance. Uh, you need to have produced social housing that is an intermediary step, so that when you're, you know, having a family, you're starting out, you're not earning as much money, that you have good social housing that you can live in, that eventually you will move out of that, you will buy your own home, and then that can go to the next person. But I also think the other thing we're not thinking about, and it's something that is coming down the tracks like a railway train to us, is artificial intelligence and the impact that will have on employment. I agree. Uh, there was a, an interesting comment I saw by someone who ran an Indian call centre, and I think we can all agree that the employees of Indian call centres are not exactly highly paid, but he laid off 97% of his staff and replaced them with AI. Cool. So, so how many jobs will, in 20 years' time, how many jobs will there be for all these these current migrants to do when they're in their 30s and 40s. You know, this is a question I, I keep asking uh, people about AI is, you know, what is the impact? And they keep, they keep saying to me, yeah, but, you know, that we'll just have different jobs. There'll be jobs for people who, um, you know, support the AI. And you just think, well, that's only going to last so long. Um, and I, I just don't think that, that there's really been... Uh, a strategy, a long-term strategy, and, and I don't think that they, anybody is thinking about it, okay? There isn't, and to be honest, the people who will be affected, it probably won't be people like you, because people probably won't want to listen to an AI uh, on a radio talk show, but it will be lawyers, it will be doctors. Mm. I, I would say the, the young doctors going on strike today, I think one of the reasons they should go, <laughs> I, I kind of support them, is because in 20, 20 years' time, maybe 5 or 10% of them will actually have a job because you think the NHS spends roughly half its budget on employing workers. Yeah, more than half its budget on employment, yeah. Exactly. So what government is going to say, well, we could cut your taxes by 10% or 50%, uh, but we won't do that because we don't want to make lots of doctors unemployed. The same will apply to, to anyone who's in a knowledge-based job and to be frank most recent developments in ai even affect things that most current ai is is, is language based it associates language and builds up models um New mathematical based AI is starting to come to the fore as well. Yeah, I mean, so you look at you look at medicine. Yeah, you look at medicine, and it's AI reading X-rays now. There's no there's no future job there. I mean, and that and that will just grow exponentially. Um, good to talk to you, Simon. Thank you very much indeed. You're with Petri, and I'm here until four o'clock. But it's now time to take a quick break. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Oh, it's, bless him, he's soaking wet. Nice. The most likely situation is that that statue is going to end up in M Shed, which is a museum just on the harbour. Nick, I, when we first went to you, I thought you dived into the harbour to get the, get the thing out, for God's sake, man. Well done, good job.
Islamism is sweeping our nation. This is not Islamophobia, this is real. Another terror attack, another killing of an MP. Oh, don't worry, let's light a candle, let's all sing, let's look, don't look back in anger and sing Kumbaya. He had a, a politically uh, minded project called WikiLeaks, which said nothing about what was going on in the Kremlin, nothing about what was going on in China. There was a clear political bias in what he was doing. This is the first time Millam has heard of asylum seekers coming to the town. If we are guinea pigs, then I think we should have been consulted. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Well, it will be a problem if they start breaking into people's homes because they can break into yours and decide that you're not doing enough. <laughs> they can break into mine and decide I'm not doing enough. And I'll tell you what, if they break into my home, it will get violent. That's for sure. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? <laughs> What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, it. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> There are no banners calling for the release of the condemn, hostages. They will not there condemn are no Hamas. banners, Kevin. You can't say everyone on that march not, when no, we can't say Hamas. Hamas. Sorry, no, I, yeah. sorry, I've got, I've got you both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You can't. Good. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? What on earth? is going on in the House of Commons. I'll try my very best to explain that, Daisy, but it is an extremely complicated situation. This just absolutely stinks. Right, Neil Parrish, he was great for his area. If Richard Soon actually brought him out today and said, this guy's going to be advised by a special right. case. If anybody can pull it off, it'll be him. Oh. <laughs> what? Oh. What? <laughs> my your mind. mind. <laughs> it's not our minds, it's your mouth, Mr. Unbelievable. Collins. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Hi, good afternoon to you. It's Petri here with you until four o'clock. Um, and uh, we've been talking about MPs and how uh, they now are so fearful of their safety that we've, we, you and I, have had to pay for them to have close protection officers and chauffeur-driven cars to keep them safe. Um, so I'm wondering what you think the state of democracy is or can be if MPs are too terrified to speak to their conscience. So give me a call on that, 0344 499 1000. I also want to hear from you if you think you were missold your car loan, because if you do think you were missold your car loan, you could be getting thousands of pounds in compensation. Um, so give me a call about Not that I can, not that I know, and I can't, you know, if you phone me and say, can I have compensation, I'm not going to be able to give it to you. But, but we can have a conversation about it. Uh, in the meantime, spiking is now an epidemic in this country. That is the sort of illegal drugging of a stranger or somebody you know. Um, it's difficult to know how prevalent the practice is because few victims ever report the incidents to the police because they feel ashamed or they feel guilty or they don't know where it happened or they don't know what happened. Um, in uh, 2022 to 23, the Police Chiefs Council registered 6,732 spiking incidents. Uh, 4,643 were administered by drink and this is horrifying, 957 by needle. So to be injected with this drug. Um, the YouGov poll says 11% of women have been spiked and 6% of men. This is an outrage. I was talking to one of my uh, team for the show that I do in, uh, uh, in the evening. I do um, 10 till 1. So if you want to, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, on this channel. Um, and she said that she and her friends wear a leather jacket when they go to a concert. 
or to something like that because they fear a needle being shoved into their arm. I mean, that is shocking. She's 22 years old and she's got to consider, oh, I know, I'll wear a leather jacket to that so I can't get spiked. Um, let's now turn to Dawn Dines, to, uh, who's from Stamp Out Spiking. Uh, Dawn, uh, good afternoon to you. Thank you very much indeed for joining me. These numbers and percentages are horrific. They are horrific. And to be honest with you, with those stats that you've just quoted from the National Police Chief um, Crime Council, they are just a tip of the iceberg because when we actually done a our, our own survey here at Stamp Out Spiking, over 97% of victims didn't actually report getting spiked to the police. And Oof. like you say, it's a bit, they're ashamed, they're embarrassed, and they just, and, and and to be honest with you, when these drugs go out of your system, you, you're very confused. You don't, somebody's actually poisoned you. That's what's actually happening on our streets. And, and the, the shocking, I mean, I tell you, where would they be getting... Are these drugs easy to get hold of? Obviously, we don't want to give anybody any ideas, but are these drugs yeah. particularly easy to get hold of? Well, they they must be. You know, mm. we, we, we're hearing from people on the streets that the drug of choice at the moment is ketamine, and that can be used in spiking incidents. There's also rahipnol, but there's also prescription drugs, you know. And a little while ago, I was I was in a pub and I overheard a couple of girls talking, and one of them said... Oh, she was having trouble sleeping. And the other one said, oh, don't worry, my granddad gets prescribed, like, um, tamazepan, and I can give you those. And I was like, oh, my God. So yeah. we've, we've got to be warning people that, you know, even prescription drugs, we've, we've got to be really careful of, of those drugs as well. I mean, there's... With people carrying out this act, do they see it as a as a passive act? Because it's one of the most violent acts I think you could ever perpetrate, isn't it? Well, yeah, I believe so too. I mean, I've been campaigning for this for the for the past 20 years. We've now got the law updated because it was so antiquated. It was like poisoning with obnoxious substance, but it had to be proved it was done with malicious intent. And now, you know, the law is going to be updated. It's going through Parliament as we speak. But, you know, we need the government to be putting some serious funding into this. We need to be training bar staff, security staff, those amazing street pastors that are out every weekend, you know, volunteering their time. And or, and even taxi drivers, basically anyone who works in the nighttime economy should have an invested interest in this. And even if that's the drink industry, putting their hands in their pocket and helping out charities like, our, like ourselves. And, and talking of Spike, I mean, I, I was just mentioning there that one of my uh, team on my show uh, says that she and her friends will wear leather jackets when they, if they go to a concert or anything. I, I mean, horrific. I just can't even imagine even having to think in, in those in those terms. But how, you know, is this spiking happening? I mean, the needle spiking, I am I, absolutely gobsmacked about, but the the drink spiking and all of those things. What what is the process of that? How do you potentially know that you've been spiked? How do you potentially protect yourself from it? Well, first of all, if you these these drugs once they're put into your system, they they take probably about twenty minutes before they really take effect. So if you start to get a blurred vision and you start to feel really drunk really quickly, like a, you feel like a bit of an out-of-body experience, then you need to get to a trusted member of staff or a trusted friend really quickly and tell them what's happened to you so that they can safeguard you. I mean, there are protective drink covers. I don't know if you saw in the Sunday Times today that they we've got sort of spikies, these little counters that can be put in top of a bottle. There's also stop tops which are like a foil to protect your drink. And if anybody tampers with it, it will rip. And, you know, never leave your drink unattended either. There's also like a scrunchie called a nightcap. And I think the more bars that st suddenly start taking on this training, like we need these big corporates like Weatherspoons and, and you know, all those other massive corporate companies, they need to be training all of their staff on spiking issues. And, with the new legislation which is coming in from the Home Secretary, it's going to be now sort of mandatory by the end of this year for people who work in the security industries authority 
to have some sort of form of of training on spiking issues because these are the key people that are going to be keeping us safe yeah when we're all like the guys on security is, you know they are brilliant actually if you're in if you're ever in any trouble um hey, the, the thing with amazing. with um uh, with the spiking though i always imagine that somebody who is going to uh, carry out this act is is like a hyena looking at a pack of uh, of antelope and they'll they'll be looking for the weak one at the back or the one that is slightly more separated from from the others they're not necessarily going to go for the for the you know the the confident person with close friends around them well we say that but you know we've had so many you imagine i i, I love that analogy as well because that's exactly what it is people are out praying yeah. and looking for the weak link but you know, the reports that we've had, we even had a report today, I don't know if you've seen it, from Kate McGann, um, who said that she was spiked as well. And she was out with a group of friends. Now, if you, I always try and look at the person who's doing this, the perpetrator. So if somebody is going out and they're doing this and they spiked like a couple of people, one goes off to the toilet, the other one goes off towards the exit, and then they can take you off because as I said earlier, these date rape drugs, they you can't put up a fight, you become compliant, and then you're left with no memory what's happened to you. So it's it's very serious, it really is. And it's about time that, like I said, that the government are gonna start backing charities and 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 getting this training out there because it, it's imperative it really is and it's also i understand uh, drugs are being used in this way to make people compliant to being robbed uh, they'll be walked to a cash machine um yep. and and told to empty their account they do it willingly or at least you know because of the drug uh, and and people are being just left wandering the streets with with no knowledge of what they've done, and they've just willingly handed over all of their bank account. Yeah, well, I mean, we've we've had. I got contacted recently by a mum, and her son was out in London, and that, that exactly the same thing happened. He was drugged in a pub, taken off, and now he can't even claim his money back. So it's yeah. you know that this is happening for robbery. It's happening for sexual assault. And even bribery, we, we heard a few years ago from Andrew Castle, and he said that a lady spiked him and got him into a taxi, and he just managed to undo the window of the taxi and got some fresh air and got the taxi driver to let her go. And then a few years later, he saw that she was actually spiking men and bribing them. So oh. this isn't just happening, you know, everyone assumes it's men doing it to women. No, 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 it's that's... men as well that's happening to. Well, how do you, yeah. I mean, okay, so, so that we've talked about, you know, having to cover your drink, never leaving your drink alone, but what else should you do um, if you're out with, with a, a small group of friends? What, what is the best way to proceed to make sure that you all get home safely? Well, you know, like they do in the military, I was speaking to, um, I've done a podcast recently with a gentleman whose son is in the military and they have somebody called um, on shark watch. So that's having someone who's sober that goes out with you, that looks out for you all. You know, there's some different apps now. There's like the Holly Guard app, which we recommend for people to look at and use. So there's lots of different ways that you can be safeguarding and also you know, everyone should be looking out, not just for their friends, but for everybody. If you see somebody doing something untoward to somebody else's drink, then please go and tell the bar staff, the security staff, or even the person who's, whose drink has been tampered with. And while we were talking about the needle spiking, I mean, luckily that's pretty minuscule on the whole scheme of things. But also um, I'd like to warn your viewers as well that vapes are actually being spiked as well so what? please be careful if anybody comes to you and says would you like to try my blueberry vape no thank you because they're spiking vapes what yeah that i didn't know crikey that's terrifying it is terrifying so just um, keep an eye on each other and and i yeah. mean i can't imagine there would ever be a case where somebody would see somebody spiking a drink and not tell the bar staff surely well you'd like to think so wouldn't you we really I mean, would yeah these, these people who were doing this we're, i've been talking to 
you know, psychologists, criminologists, toxicologists, and we've been trying to work out that there's this real grey area, and this is where we've got a big survey on at the moment. So if anybody who's been affected by spiking, if you could go to our website at Stamp Out Spiking, because we're trying to find out, like, where we're letting people down on the victim's journey. So when you've actually been spiked and you're out, what happens to you? Why are we not gaining convictions? And time and time again, it's it's so prevalent that, you know, the, the testing. So if you and I went out tonight and one of us got spiked and we went straight to the hospital, they would not test us for to see what drug was in our system because they believe that is the police's job. The police are under resource. They can't get there on time. Some of these date rape drugs can go out of your system as quick as six hours. So we've got a little chance to be able to, to gain that toxicology report. So really it's urgently needed. For me, I need to be seeing the police and I need to be seeing the NHS in the same room, working out some strategy that we can actually get this testing done in time so we can start gaining convictions and we're, and, that, and that then gives us the power back doesn't it, it, it uh, having had it taken away from us so ruthlessly exactly. at least then we've got a little bit of power back yeah exactly and you know i believe that getting all those right people in the room i mean we had all this rapid testing for covid we've just been through all of that all of us together so why can't we have the same sort of thing i've I've got hospitals and toxicologists that are waiting to do yeah. this, you know. No, it's a good we just question. Need the government. Yeah, we just need the backing for that. Dawn, thank you so much. Pleasure talking to you. Uh, Dawn Dines there, stamp out spiking. I shall never taste anybody's vape ever again. Uh, look, stay where you are. There's so much more conversation to come and so much more of you. This is Talk TV. Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Oh, it's, bless him, he's soaking wet. Well. The most likely situation is that that statue is going to end up in M Shed, which is a museum just on the harbour. Nick, I, when we first went to you, I thought you dived into the harbour to get the, get the thing out, for God's sake, man. Well done, good job. Islamism is sweeping our nation. This is not Islamophobia, this is real. Another terror attack, another killing of an MP. Oh, don't worry, let's light a candle, let's all sing, let's look, don't look back in anger and sing Kumbaya. He had a a politically uh, minded project called WikiLeaks, which said nothing about what was going on in the Kremlin, nothing about what was going on in China. There was a clear political bias in what he was doing. This is the first time Millam has heard of asylum seekers coming to the town. If we are guinea pigs, then I, I think we should have been consulted. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Well, it will be a problem if they start breaking into people's homes because they can break into yours and decide that you're not doing enough. <laughs> they can break into mine and decide I'm not doing enough. And I'll tell you what, if they break into my home, it will get violent. That's for sure. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? You know? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, is it? There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> There are no banners calling for and the release of the condemn, hostages. They will not there are no Hamas. banners, Kevin. You can't say everyone on that march not, when no, it comes to Hamas. Not sorry, no, I'm yeah. sorry, I've got, I've got you both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you can't. Like, good. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? What on earth 
is going on in the House of Commons? I'll try my very best to explain that, Daisy, but it is an extremely complicated situation. This just absolutely stinks. Right, Neil Parrish, he was great for his area. If Richard Sunak actually have brought him out today and said, this guy's going to be advised by a special right. If anybody can pull it off, it'll be him. Oh, <laughs> what? Oh. What? <laughs> Your <laughs> mind. <laughs> it's not our mind, it's your mouth, Mr. Unbelievable. Collins. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. I'm getting ready for my new primetime show on Talk TV and Radio, 7 o'clock Saturday night, James Whale Unleash. I don't need you coming in here, following me around with a gun. I'm so sorry about this. Saturdays at 7 on Talk TV. Hello and a very, very good afternoon. Cheers. Petri here with you for the next hour. And then don't forget, we've got Trisha coming up. Yes, the wonderful Trisha is here at four o'clock. So, um, it's me here, though, until then, and we have much to discuss in this hour, not least of which is, do you have a wild animal living next door? Um, I'm not talking about the neighbour himself or herself, I'm talking about their pets, because the Born Free Foundation is saying that there are so many wild animals living in this country, even though they're licensed, and they're concerned about the growing numbers. So we'll be talking about that a little bit later on. Uh, now, though, we have to turn our attention, because it's fascinating, right? It's fascinating, to what's going on over the pond. Across the pond, Donald Trump is one step closer to the Republican presidential nomination after a massive win over Nikki Haley in her back garden, I think that is, isn't it, in South Carolina. Well, joining me now is Greg Swenson, who's chair of Republicans Overseas UK. Um, good time for Trump, isn't it? Yeah, he's doing well. I mean, it, it, there's, there's no doubt that he's going to win the nomination, barring some crisis of some sort but um all well, the he seems to do well with crises yeah all the crises in the past have helped him right? yeah or most of them the indictments the mugshot you know trying to bar him from this the, the ballots in a couple of states so that all you know ends up helping him especially it with really republicans does. Yeah. yeah i mean is this because he i mean he is he he invented the term fake news it, right. it's one now that will stick forever yeah. um he um is always saying that everybody's lying about him it's all not true it's all not true and he plays to his base who feel victimized by politics or by yeah. government anyway so they're thinking oh here, at last here's somebody who's saying what i'm thinking even if it isn't true yeah and he does exaggerate you know he uses hyperbole hyper <laughs> to say the least but but he does say what people are thinking mm. and he's very and, and that un unfiltered way of delivering was quite refreshing in 2015 and 16 and one of the reasons he won in 2016 so you know that that has a real great appeal and i think voters were just fed up with with elected representatives on both sides of the aisle and so he had he really tapped into that tea party movement that started in 2009 and 10 he didn't really create it but he just he tapped into mm. it he understood the voters were really frustrated yeah and, and so you know again that's that's Sometimes it's frustrating, but also it's it's quite it's quite refreshing. Oh yeah, I mean you you, you can see why he has the popular uh, uh, vote, but isn't it a bit low base? It it there is there, it can there's, be really yeah. I mean that that's that's one of his flaws, and and it gets votes in many sectors, and he's he's picked up a lot of people uh, to support him that either were not Republicans prior to 2015 or they were not really engaged and didn't vote so he's, he's managed to appeal to to this new base but it also frustrates some people that are more traditional conservatives that are just you know kind of a, fed up with the with the banter you know with the insults yeah, yeah. and the, you know and it does sort of it, it does reduce politics to you know trench warfare sometimes and well, it, well it reduces it to the playground yeah it does doesn't it? The, the way the he bullying. takes yeah. the mick out of disabled reporters or, right. or has done things i mean it's like unthinkable and, behavior and, and what happens is you know he he's unfiltered so mm. that most of the time it works and the and it, the, the party in many ways has become a 
cult of personality, and he's mm. got a really notable personality. You know, like him or not, um, he does really well in rallies. He's he appeals to people. Um, he does have a, a quite a personality. The problem is you're going to miss sometimes. You know, it's, it's like a comedian. Yeah. You know, twenty yeah, yeah. percent of the times so you're going to miss. So you know, the, the last one when he sort of tried to insult Nikki Haley because her husband wasn't at the rallies or at, at her campaign events. Well, it's because he's been deployed to Africa with the United States Army. Yeah. So you know, that really lost him. It didn't. It wasn't enough to to hurt him in South Carolina materially. But you know, he went from two weeks ago he was up thirty five points in the polls and he ended up winning up 20 points okay so it's still a, a big victory mm. you know for for it, if you consider him not to be an incumbent it's it's a huge margin so it didn't cost him the election i mean and that margin is relative as well isn't some, it because it's down on what he had before it, that's right but, but it's relative it's to still what pretty yeah. significant yeah. but the other yeah. thing to consider is you know is trump a a quasi incumbent candidate and I think I could make that argument so it worries me about the general election I'm not worried about the nomination at this point you know I supported Ron DeSantis didn't work out I don't think Nikki Haley has a chance so it looks like you know President like Trump, Trump will be yeah. the, the, the candidate but in the general election it's never a good sign when an incumbent president is polling anywhere below 90 in his own party and he, he's doing well in the party he's got I think it, the 72 percent of Republicans in South Carolina voted for him Nikki Haley did really well with independence. She beat Trump 60 to 40 with independence, but he beat her 60 to 40 overall. But 72 percent of Republicans, yeah. that sounds like a lot, but for an incumbent president, it's a very bad sign. The best thing that he has going for him is Biden is worse. Yeah. And, and he's an incumbent also, and a real incumbent, and not polling at 90 in his own party. But he's also behaving like... Um the president in waiting anyway in terms of, of blocking money to Ukraine in, in, in making it clear that he will be very unhappy with anybody who who does now what they wouldn't do if he was president and, and that how is that allowed to happen in a democracy well I mean he is the leader of the party whether it's official or not you know he is the most popular but he candidate. is putting pressure on he, he is he seems to be putting pressure I think a lot of that's from an electoral perspective as well if someone doesn't endorse Trump or even when he to said a certain to degree me, his policies come back and bite you. then you know then he, he ends up threatening that you know that that candidate could or that that representative could be primaried and that's what they're all afraid of you notice a lot of people who you wouldn't expect to support President Trump mm. endorsed him and endorsed him pretty early and that I think is is the power that he has in the party. Well, because he's like, he's like a thug. He's promising ultimate and absolute revenge. I mean, when do you hear that's not presidential no, language? It, it, that's not even and, statesman. And I language. think what he he should be doing is try to to pick up those voters who maybe were maybe Trumpers, not never Trumpers, but yeah. maybe Trumpers. And that's where that's a lot of Nikki Haley's support. What he should be doing is reaching out and trying to develop a coalition in the party. So. So that's and that there, so there's a risk that that this he runs into trouble in a general election because if you know the, I saw a poll coming out of South Carolina it said 36 percent that had voted would not vote for him if he had a conviction. Now I don't know that that 36 number is realistic. It might have just been. You know, I've some, seen elections in America where a donkey has been but, elected. Yeah, so. well, yeah, that happens. It's <laughs> called democracy. But you know, ten, but ten, I mean, you know, a literal but if, donkey. But even if he gets, ten, even if 10 percent of Republicans don't yeah. vote for him because he has a, a conviction on one of these indictments, that's a really big number, and that that could have an effect, especially if he doesn't reach out to independents and and to moderates. Yeah, and and there's a good chance that he will be. In, in, in one or two yeah, of these cases. I, He's got so was, many cases against him. I mean, I could make an argument, it's just a longer conversation, but I, I do think a lot of these indictments are really baseless, but it doesn't matter. He's got a really hostile ju jury pool in Washington and in New York City. And so, you know, he could definitely have a conviction mm. or two or several. And so, the, you know, they might get overturned on appeal. You know, I could, again, make Can an argument. Can he pardon himself? It's uh, it would be unprecedented. There's no, there's nothing, there's <laughs> no statute him, though, in place because it? <laughs> it's just never happened. But uh, in theory, yes. Yeah, in there's theory, he could get to be can. president and say, right, I'm. But, uh, I'm but it, he, he wouldn't be able to pardon himself on some of the state and local, no, uh, no. Uh, you know. So, you know, I, look, I, I think, you know, I could make an, even though I didn't support Trump in this whole primary process, I could make a really good argument that the, the justice system has been weaponized. I mean, these, these. The only one that's got any merit of, of the four big indictments 
is the, the document case. If you just looked at the letter of the law, like, did he break some rules? Yes. Well, in New but, York, I mean, it's reasonable to say that he exaggerated his, his wealth. Yeah. And I, mean, I mean, come on. It was a uh, civil case. That yeah. they, they couldn't but, make but a, still. Uh, they couldn't make a criminal case out of it, so no. they did a civil case. I mean, yeah, if, if you really... If you really want to, stick to of course, you know, yeah. like most real estate developers do, and there's, you know, the, the Deutsche Bank. But we Bank, still haven't seen his taxes, have Do we? We still haven't seen his tax returns. Uh, no, they were released. He didn't release them himself, but they were um, they were hacked. Because he's going to have to release them again, ago. isn't he? He doesn't have to, but it, someone from the New York Times will hack oh, into we'll the system. Yeah. You know? And so, okay. look, I, but I could I could ar I could make the the argument that those those cases were really frivolous. But it doesn't matter, you know. Mm. If he, if and and the documents case, there's there are some there there is some merit to that one. But you have to look at it in the context of Biden's document case. Yes, yeah, I'm you just going to say. And if you try to treat them equally, both would would be breaking the law. Both would be indicted and and convicted. But I don't know that that's a good idea because if you do it to Trump, you have to do it to Biden. The, the thing I'd, I want to talk about with, with Trump, I mean, we'll, we'll get to the NATO thing if we can, but uh, it's been talked about a lot. But is who who is going to be his running mate? I mean, because and it's the same true uh, of, of of Biden yeah. in a sense that their running mate, their, 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 the, the the number two, mm -hmm. has never been more important biden's age trump's that, that age is right. that is uh, i mean the, yeah. the 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 vice president could very likely be the president of the united states that's right but nobody seems to be discussing that or even saying look i've chosen this person because if i don't make it i need to trust that this person can yeah. run the u.s no doubt and i think that makes trump's decision really important really and, and you know there's there's a list you know it's probably a short list six to ten doesn't mean that he'd be sensible to take Nikki Haley if she'd go. That would be sensible from an electoral perspective. Yeah. In, in in other words, you know, she could draw more independents more and moderates, yeah, yeah. expand the the coalition. The problem is, I think Republicans would be really disappointed, especially the because Trumpian. She's a woman. No, no, not at all. But the because I think there's several women that are on the short list. Um, you know, at, at the very least two right now. Um, Christy Nome, the governor of South Dakota, and uh, Elaine Stefanak, who's a, a, a congressman from New York. And, and they've, they were at CPAC almost, you know, auditioning for it. But so the, nothing to do with gender. It's more that, that Nikki, even, even Don Jr. has said critical things about even the potential of Nikki Haley as vice president. I think she'd lose the base, the, the core right. Trumpian base. So he's got to thread the needle. And I think it's, but it's, it's really important. There's, and I, I think it'll be one of the people from this list, but who knows? And but it, it, it's it is really critical. critical. And I, if you look at Biden, that's a huge advantage for Trump. If he picks someone that's credible and yeah. responsible, you know, Ron DeSantis for sure, that would be such an advantage in the general election because people like Kamala even less than they like Joe. I mean, he's polling at 40 and 38. I'd be, I'd find it difficult to pick her out in a lineup. I mean, it, she's been she's, practically invisible. And the, wor for the, the word salads, time. and she, she's really really poor a really poor candidate she ran for president in 2020 she didn't even make it to iowa she she polled you know never more than one or two percent in if south she, carolina if, if, if biden wins she could be the next president i think she will be yeah, yeah i mean and, which is frightening i mean it really is and i think that will be a, a an issue at come the general election in november but, but, but donald trump won't hire a second a second person, a, 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 you know, the vice president, if you like, that he thinks is better than him. The, so, is it, I mean, yeah, so there's some merit to that. They're, 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 uh, which is stupid. Yeah. Okay. It, because it, he's it, not a spring chicken he, either. He'll demand loyalty. Okay. And, and but he's bound to pick someone with less charisma, less about them, less everything, because he doesn't want the spotlight drawn yeah, off him. There's. A, that's a really good point, and you know, that's that's something, and it doesn't mean you can't have both. I mean, it, it might be someone. And Mike Pence, I think, did did this creatively. You know, I think Mike Pence had his issues with with Trump, but he laid low and supported him mm. and and took you know took the role well, because, seriously because he had aspirations to but, president. Yeah, and, and he also brought a, a, con, a much better conservative record to the ticket. Mm. And I think Trump needed that at the time because conservatives were really suspicious. Yeah, Trump about needs Trump. somebody who knows about politics. He needs yeah. somebody who's been in Congress, who, who who's worked the streets, yeah. who work, has worked the legislation, right. right? Has worked with legislature because Trump, although he doesn't want to listen to anybody, he right. does still need to be told, listen mate, 
that's and he you, did, and he you, did pretty you well in his first term. You know, again, we were all suspicious of yeah. how he would govern, but he ended up governing much more conservatively than we had suspected and and we were really, all this pretty time, pleased though? well that's a great question we don't know and because and it sounds like he's I, got he, he's definitely i would think to maybe govern from a more populist angle and i think his vice president will be someone that's more trumpian than yeah. someone like mike pence who was more conservative but he got great advice from mike pompeo mike pence even even paul ryan who was who was the speaker of the house at the time if you look at his great accomplishments they were very conservative in nature. Um, the Abraham Accords, the economy, which, which you know, produced wage growth for, for the very people that de Democrats mm -hmm. depend on for votes, you know, the, the, the bottom 10%, the bottom quartile, women, Hispanics, African Americans, all, all did really well under, under Trump. So he, he, he definitely governed and took some advice. Sometimes he didn't take the advice, he, he wasn't perfect. But I would hope that he could surround himself with the same type of people in his uh, second term. My money's on him getting more people that are like him yeah, and therefore and that, creating and that, a, a monster. Well, it wouldn't, um, I don't know if it would be monstrous, but it would be a little more chaotic. There'd be nobody to question him, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and that, that wouldn't be healthy. Where, where, is, uh, where are Trump and Biden on the world stage currently? Because Trump has definitely not covered himself in any glory with the NATO comments, yeah, um, which may be popular, but are ultimately stupid. So, so it's a great question, and and I think that the the world right now probably views Biden as more dependable for for the and, and if you just look at the way he campaigned in 2020, America's back, American leadership, it was all complete hoax because he he's really failed on the world stage. You know, starting with Afghanistan. He's in, done. He's done pretty well domestic. Twenty twenty one. I mean, in terms it's of the policies that he's he's ticked off the, and the, done. What the Democrats will argue is he's had these great accomplishments, mm. which he did get legislation through and passed. But they were horrible legislative acts. You know, mm. the, the the you know Build Back Better, which he didn't get through, which which I would call Build Back Stupid. Um, but the inflation, the Inflationary Inflation Reduction Act, you know, just massive government spending. So. Yeah, a Democrat would say he's had some accomplishments, which he has, but those have been failures, absolute failures. That's what created the inflation mm -hmm. problem that we had, and it affected the world. So I think the world probably views Biden better than Trump because Trump's so disruptive and, and unfiltered and impolite. But look at when you look at outcomes, what's better for the world? Peace and prosperity. Trump delivered both. Biden has delivered neither. And, and it's been a... And but do I think, you honestly think that Trump is a president for peace? Is he seriously yeah. going to go back yeah. on his word and say, oh, look, England's just been bombed, you're on your own? No, I don't think he would, especially not with England. Well, then he's going to have but to go back on his word, it, isn't it's, he? It's, um, his, his delivery is unfiltered and clumsy, right? And so, what he, but he did the same thing in 2017. But you get the sense that he's he, showing off, that it, he got a bit of a laugh about yeah. NATO, so he wrapped so it he runs up and it, yeah. runs with it and goes, oh, you can do what you like to any country but, that doesn't pay their bills. It's and, like, come on. And, and that, was, that was reckless, right? In, in terms Stupid of, in terms but, of world security. Right. But if you look at what he did in 2017, he made the same argument. And it worked, right? He so made the went, same argument, yeah. but he didn't say, Russia, you can do what no, you like. That's, and that's, this is after yeah, this. It's a very different landscape. Absolutely. It's the same, it's, it, he did the same thing in South Carolina when he talked about, you know, um, Nikki Haley's husband, Michael. You know, yeah. it's just, it, he, he definitely lost some support with mm. the military people mm. and, and, and uh, military so spouses, We are in a sure. very different world. Yeah. No, I think, I think you're right. And, 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 but we're in a very different world because of Biden, right? And I think that's the way voters are well, going to Well, I mean, Putin and, and you sure, know, others have had a little bit of a hand of, in that. Of course, but, 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 you know. but if you look at what, what created a, a, an environment that was advantageous to the Putins of the world and the mullahs in Iran, it was... Well, it was Trump, Trump has said he'll fix the war in day one. He, was not, he doesn't oh, yeah. want that money to go through. He'll, He's going to, you know, say to Russia, right. take the bit of Ukraine you want and he, we'll back you. That's not a good leading yeah, policy either. Yeah, a lot of, like I said, his, his remarks are often clumsy and egotistical and stupid. sometimes unfortunate. <laughs> but yeah, sometimes they're stupid, right? But look at what he does. And so he took office in 2017. Obama and Biden had been shipping, you know, ready to eat meals and blankets to a, an air base, a U.S. air base in Poland, and then trucking it in commercial trucks, not American flag, to, to Kiev. And, and so, yes, supporting Ukraine, but with non-lethal 
material. Mm -hmm. And then Trump comes in and it's Javelin missiles day one. And so, Except so he's responsible for holding back this 60 billion in, in, package. In, it, well, at, right now it looks like the, it, an easy flip the switch. Biden could, I, I don't know why he doesn't do this. If they asked me to advise him, I could give him great advice. He could win on the Ukraine package by enforcing the laws on the border. And, and it would be a double whammy. I mean, he would, he would win on both counts. He would finally do something about the humanitarian crisis at the border, which he created. And at the same time, the Republicans would flip on the Ukraine aid because all they're asking for is, well, they're not asking for money. They're just saying, the Republicans, they're saying, we'll give you the money for Ukraine if you actually enforce the border laws that, that were uh, legislated by Congress. And by Biden not doing that, he's, he's, he's held up the, and, it, and you could argue, you know, we shouldn't tie the two together, they're apples yeah. and oranges, but they are tied together because it's, it's national security. Both are national security. We have 10 million illegal migrants running around the country right now that just shouldn't have crossed the border. And Biden opened the border. He, he, he's been, he, I think he's been overly influenced by the open border wing of his party. And he could, he could win votes by executing border law. And at the same time, he could get 60 billion to Ukraine. Well, and he I mean, do it. He, let's uh, let's hope he picks shame. up your 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 phone. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <I hope> so. <laughs> your call, Greg. Thank yeah, you. It's been a pleasure to talking here. to you. Thanks for having uh, me. Greg Swenson, there, chair of Republicans Overseas UK. Going to take a quick break. Be back in just a moment. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and you're on your smart speaking. Oh, it's, bless him, he's soaking wet. Yes. The most likely situation is that that statue is going to end up in M Shed, which is a museum just on the harbour. Nick, I, when we first went to you, I thought you dived into the harbour to get the, get the thing out, for God's sake, man. Well done, good job. Islamism is sweeping our nation. This is not Islamophobia, this is real. Another terror attack, another killing of an MP. Oh, don't worry, let's light a candle, let's all sing, let's look, don't look back in anger and sing Kumbaya. He had a, a politically uh, minded project called WikiLeaks. It said yeah. nothing about what was going on in the Kremlin, nothing about what was going on in China. There was a clear political bias in what he was doing. This is the first time Millam has heard of asylum seekers coming to the town. If we are guinea pigs, then I, I think we should have been consulted. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Well, it will be a problem if they start breaking into people's homes because they can break into yours and decide that you're not doing enough. <laughs> they can break into mine and decide I'm not doing enough. And I tell you what, if they break into my home, it will get violent. That's for sure. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? <laughs> What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> what? Is it? There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> There are no banners calling for the release of the condemn, hostages. They will not there condemn are no Hamas. banners, Kevin. You can't say everyone on that march not, when no, we can't say them on that Sorry, no, I, yeah. sorry, I've got, I've got you both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you no, can't. It's good. I'm, so, I'm no, sorry. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? What on earth? is going on in the House of Commons. I'll try my very best to explain that, Daisy, but it is an extremely complicated situation. This just absolutely stinks. Right, Neil Parrish, he was great for his area. Rishi Sunak actually brought him out today and said, this guy's going to be advised by a special right. If anybody can pull it off, it'll be him. Oh, <laughs> what? Oh. What? <laughs> your your mind. <laughs> it's not our mind, it's your mouth, Mr. Unbelievable. 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 Yeah. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Hello and a very good afternoon to you. It's Petri here with you for the next half an hour and then the fantastic Tricia uh, will be with you to take you through your drive time this afternoon. Now, wild animals next door. If you thought that the cat living next to you was the wildest thing ever, you would be wrong unless you're my neighbour. Uh, because my cat, she's always coming back with torn ears and a bloody nose. She's obviously been fighting and I don't know what she's been fighting but she fights everything and then she comes home she hates women she only likes men and yeah and when my when my friends come around she'll sit on their lap and then just bite them for no particular reason whatsoever so there's something quite wrong about Miss Edith um, although she's very beautiful and that's the problem but what about proper wild animals that might live next door to you do you have a neighbor with a snake or a cougar or um, a crocodile. Yeah, they do exist and they do live in British homes. Shocking research has revealed that there are over 2,700 dangerous animals being kept as pets in the UK. Now, these, I, my understanding is that they are, they do have a license, but there are cheetahs in Cheshire um, to Cayman crocodiles in Kent. And there are exotic deadly animals lurking in almost every corner of the UK. Um, there could be lions. I kept saying earlier, lions and tigers and bears, oh my. What are these animals doing as pets? Surely that's not right. So we decided to talk to Dr Mark Jones, who's head of policy at Born Free. Um, hi, it's good to talk to you. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's hard to imagine that somebody wants to live with a crocodile. It certainly is. Um, I mean, the motivation, uh, the reasons why people might want to um, get hold of some of these wild animals is, I must admit, completely beyond my comprehension. But uh, I work for the Born Free Foundation, and at Born Free, we've been campaigning for decades for greater protection for wild animals from the exotic pet trade. And over recent years, we've been monitoring the number of animals being kept under what are called dangerous wild animal licenses. Uh, these are animals that are listed and considered to be dangerous under something called the Dangerous Wild Animals Act. So you have to have a license to keep them. And uh, as you've said, in 2023, uh, local authorities issued licenses for more than 2,700 of these dangerous wild animals across Britain. And they included around 200 large and small wild cats, everything from lions to cheetahs, uh, lots of uh, what are called servals, which are kind of medium-sized African wildcats, and savannah cats, which have become very popular, which are crosses between uh, wildcats and domestic cats. Uh, but they also uh, included 250-odd primates, something like 400 ven venomous snakes, and 90 crocodilians, that's crocodiles, alligators, and caimans. Um, now, when it was enacted back in the 1970s, the Dangerous Wild Animals Act was supposed to make the keeping of these kinds of animals what they called at the time in Parliament a wholly exceptional experience. But in our view, it's clearly failing to do this, you know, with the figures that we've that we've dug up. And in this day and age, it seems unbelievable that so many dangerous wild animals continue to be legally kept in people's homes and gardens and on small holdings across Britain. So it never comes as a surprise to you then when you hear about the beast of the moors or whatever, then somebody say, oh, I've seen something that looks like a big cat. Uh, you're not surprised then because it probably is. Well, it could be uh, because there are circumstances where these animals, uh, these animals do escape or sometimes yeah. they're deliberately released or whatever. I mean, under the Dangerous Wild Animals Act, um, uh, which is, uh, which is it, uh, the responsibility for uh, making sure that people get the licenses and those people who do get licenses uh, are able to keep their animals uh, safely from a, a human safety perspective and also in conditions which are suitable for the animals. Uh, the, the responsibility for that lies with local authorities. Um, but as we all know, lo local authorities, uh, you know, are, are really stretched. Um, and um, at best, uh, the level uh, of resources and expertise that local authorities are able to put into making sure 
that uh, that uh, these animals are kept safely and appropriately it probably varies enormously across the country. Um, and at worst, we just don't think that, that local authorities are the, are the appropriate organisations to take on this task. So, you know, this is a, a, a real problem and, and we're really calling for a major change in the law um, to ensure that those animals that don't belong in people's homes can't be kept in the UK. I mean, we've seen much recently, haven't we, about um, the XL bullies and, and these dogs being kept inappropriate, inappropriately in small flats, in high-rise blocks, and uh, they maybe need more exercise than, than people are giving them. I mean, that must be tenfold the issue that you could have with a, with a wild animal because i mean dogs are further slightly further away from that wild uh, since we've domesticated them but they're still fairly close and 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 yet a, a, a puma or a cougar is is seconds away from that wild. you can't tame the beast so to speak well it's really important to remember that what we're talking about here are wild animals as you said they haven't been domesticated for generations like our traditional companion animals like dogs and cats so they're unpredictable and they also many of them have really complex physical psychological behavioral environmental and social needs that you simply can't meet uh, in in a in a house uh, in s suburbia in the UK mm. or, or in someone's backyard, and as a result, these animals do typically suffer when they're kept as pets. Which, as well as being devastating for the animals concerned, can also make them even more unpredictable and potentially more dangerous to their owners and other people who they might come into contact with. And people can and do get injured by exotic pets. Bite wounds and scratches can introduce venoms or become infected. Well, I mean, or even worse, there was that case in America, wasn't there, about the woman who, who kept primates and at one time just attacked, tore her face off, literally. I mean, for, for, they, were, they were her beloved uh, children, in inverted commas, and they just flipped on her. Exactly. So, you know, injuries are common. They're probably much more common than we know because mm. they're probably very much underreported. Um, but these are wild animals and they can be dangerous. And uh, they can be dangerous not just to the people who keep them, but anyone else who, who might come into contact with them. And bear in mind that people can also contract diseases from exotic animals. Most reptiles carry salmonella bacteria, which can, can result in serious gastrointestinal problems in, in humans. And some birds carry bacteria bacteria which can result in respiratory diseases and there's always a chance that an exotic pet like a primate could be a carrier of a serious viral infection that could potentially mm. spread among people so uh we, you know we certainly think that this situation needs to be reformed what is it that encourages people to to get the are there films are there cartoons the lion king whatever that they see and they go oh i'd like i want one of those um, and they're clearly not people who are, are well um, educated in looking after, like somebody would be working in a zoo. Uh, these are just normal people like you and me, or me at least, um, who go, oh, I fancy having a puma. Yeah, I mean, sadly, it remains legal to keep pretty much any um, exotic wild animal as a pet in the UK, subject to the requirement for licenses for some, like uh, the ones that we're talking about here. Um, and uh, so you know, cruel. as I say, you know, what motivates someone to want to keep this? I think there's a whole host of factors. People see in, perhaps influences on social media. Mm. Uh, they see films, they see cartoons. They think, oh, wouldn't it be lovely to have one of those cute looking animals from from the cartoon? Maybe they, uh, you know, their, their children see these things and, and kind of put a lot of pressure on parents to get hold of uh, certain species of, of wild animal reptiles and so on as, as pets. Um, but these animals don't belong in people's homes. They don't make good pets and I think it's important to realize as well that the figures we've released are just the tip of the iceberg there are literally hundreds of thousands more exotic wild animals being kept as pets that don't require a license uh, and they include some animals like big constrictor snakes and monitor lizards that I think most people most right-minded people would consider to be fairly dangerous um, so this is a much bigger problem than our figures suggest
Where are they getting these uh, creatures from? I mean, uh, you used to be able to go into Harrods uh, and buy a, a lion, uh, for example, that hasn't been allowed for, for very many years. I can't imagine there are pet shops that are, are dealing in, in, uh, in cougars and, and crocodiles. Are these creatures legally bought? Uh, I mean, are they, they've obviously been imported. There's also that to consider when you're talking about cruelty. How do these creatures get here to be owned privately in the first place? Well, some are taken from the wild, and that can be a real problem for wild populations, particularly for very rare species or species that are threatened with extinction. Um, and often uh, those kind of rare species, for whatever reason, um, uh, uh, there's a demand for rare species because they're unusual, um, because they're rare. Um, others are bred in captivity, some of them mm. overseas and then uh, imported into the UK. Uh, others others may be bred here. Hobbyists, um, what are called hobbyists, people who keep whatever it is, venomous snakes or spiders or, or whatever it is, are often in contact with each other. And these days, with so much access to the media and social media through the internet, um, a lot of uh, the the sale the, and the exchange and, and information about where these animals can be so it's not always a where they can be obtained. It's, it's not always a no, legal trade then. No, it's, uh, there's legal trade and there's illegal trade, and the, the, there's a real blurring around the edges there. But as I say, in terms of keeping these animals, it does remain legal in the UK to keep almost a, almost any exotic animal as a pet, providing you get the proper permits and licences. Um, and that's something that we're that we're very very keen to see change. What do you do if you think you're living next door to a, a, a wild, uh, endangered uh, creature? and you don't think it's being looked after in the right way, do you contact the council? Do you contact RSPCA? Do you contact Born Free? I mean, who, who do you get in touch with? Well, you can certainly contact the council to uh, inquire whether uh, the animal should have a licence and whether it does have a licence. If you think that they're uh, that the animal is being kept in in poor conditions you can certainly contact the rspca um you know people who keep these animals are still subject to the animal welfare act if you keep any animal in captivity uh, in your home um then you have to un under the law you have to um, meet certain basic welfare requirements for that animal. So if, if they aren't being met, and we would suggest that in many cases with these uh, wild animals, they can never be met. No. But uh, if they're not being met properly, then there may be um, there may be offences being committed under the uh, under the Animal Welfare Act. Um, but I, I think the law isn't really working effectively uh, so what we're asking for is a complete review not just of the dangerous wild animals act which we've been talking about here but of the entire uh, legal system that, that regulates the exotic pet trade and we believe that what we need uh, is a system where you can have a list of animals that are permitted to be kept and in order to get on that list the species you have to be able to show that the species can be kept uh, in conditions which meet all the welfare requirements of the the animals concerned well that, that should be the base these... basic shouldn't it for a license absolutely I mean... Absolutely. And that uh, the risks to the health and safety of other animals and people are, are, are zero or, or at least uh, very much minimised, that the trade doesn't in any way threaten wild populations of the species concerned, and also that there's no risk of our native wildlife or, or wild habitats being uh, compromised or damaged should those animals escape yeah. or be released into the wider environment because that can also be a major problem. So this is what we're calling for. This is what some European countries are already doing. Uh, and we think it's uh, it's um, high time that these kind of systems were introduced. I mean, it's, it seems state. absolutely bonkers to me that it's, we're not already there, but there you go. And not for the first time have I been surprised today. Um, listen, it's great to talk to you. Thank you so much for, for joining me. Uh, Dr Mark Jones, Head of Policy at Born Free. There used to be in a park near me um, a woman who walked two pigs, uh, massive pigs. I mean, they weren't teacup pigs, they were the massive full-on pigs the people who live in my area will know exactly who's and they lived in her house um i never went to her house stay with me there's more to come hey very good morning to you thanks for joining us you're with talk tv on tv on radio online and we're on your smart speaking oh this, bless him he's soaking wet the most likely situation is that 
That statue is going to end up in M Shed, which is a museum just on the harbour. Nick, I, when we first went to you, I thought you dived into the harbour to get the, get the thing out, for God's sake, man. Well done. Good job. Islamism is sweeping our nation. This is not Islamophobia. This is real. Another terror attack, another killing of an MP. Oh, don't worry, let's light a candle, let's all sing, let's look, don't look back in anger and sing Kumbaya. He had a, a politically uh, minded project called WikiLeaks, which said yeah. nothing about what was going on in the Kremlin, nothing about what was going on in China. There was a clear political bias in what he was doing. This is the first time Millam has heard of asylum seekers coming to the town. If we are guinea pigs, then I think we should have been consulted. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Well, it will be a problem if they start breaking into people's homes because they can break into yours and decide that you're not doing enough. <laughs> they can break into mine and decide I'm not doing enough. And I tell you what, if they break into my home, it will get violent. That's for sure. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? <laughs> What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, miss it. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> There are no banners calling for the release of the condemn, hostages. They will not there condemn are no the banners, mass. Kevin. You can't say everyone on that march not, when no, we can't say them on the mass. Sorry, no, I'm sorry, yeah. I've, got, I've got you both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you no, can't. It's good. I'm, so, I'm no, sorry. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? What on earth? is going on in the House of Commons. I'll try my very best to explain that, Daisy, but it is an extremely complicated situation. This just absolutely stinks. Right, Neil Parrish, he was great for his area. Rishi Sunak actually brought him out today and said, this guy's going to be advised by a special right. If anybody can pull it off, it'll be him. Oh, <laughs> what? Oh. What? <laughs> your your mind. <laughs> it's not our mind, it's your mouth, Mr. Unbelievable. 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 Yeah. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Hello, good afternoon. It's Petri here with you for the next 15 minutes, I think. That's it. And then it is Trisha, so you're not going to want to go anywhere. Um, we've been uh, talking this afternoon about being a victim of uh, buying, being missold the uh, loan for your car. So you may be in for a big payout if that has happened to you. We've been talking about MP security as we learned that uh, three MPs now from across parties uh, have now got uh, private bodyguards and chauffeur-driven cars because they feel unsafe in Britain today. Um, and we've been talking about animals and these wild animals that are living in normal houses and flats around the country. It's cruel. I just think it's I think you're cruel if you're doing that. You're cruel. Um, Penny agrees with me. She says, uh, afternoon, Petri. Anyone who takes an animal from its natural habitat is cruel and wicked and has no genuine love of animals. I agree. Uh, John, uh, I think this is the John that I think fancies himself a bit. Is that you, John? He says, uh, I want to get a liger. It's a lion-tiger cross, but I'm worried it'll chew the furniture. It'll do more than chew the furniture, John. Um, and this one says, uh, I lived in an Oxfordshire village and used to feed uh, 16 wild foxes every night in the back field behind my garden. One night, a huge wolf <laughs> appeared with them. I'm not surprised they've been telling their mates. You know, don't feed wild animals. They tell all their friends. Um, and I nearly jumped back over the fence, though I didn't. I emailed a certain TV animal programme thinking this was a huge incident for them to come and film. They didn't even reply. And that's from Peter, who's age 65, thank you for that, in Oxfordshire. Uh, Barry is uh, on the line now. Where are you calling from, Barry? 
I'm sorry, it's from Wigan, Petra. From Wigan. Good afternoon. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, good to speak to you. Now, you we were talking earlier about um, pensions and whether working pensioners who are collecting their pensions should pay national insurance or not. And you think they should? I know they don't because I'm bec I've become one recently. Ah. Uh, well, that'll explain it then. You're slightly biased. Uh, <laughs> most, well, yes, perhaps I am, but most people that continue to work after they retire, or when they can retire, need to continue working. We've not all got pension pots that we can retire. No, well, I certainly haven't. Play golf. Yeah, I won't be able to retire, um, which is just as well, because I don't think I'll ever get there, because uh, they're moving the age up and up, aren't they? Um, but if you're... If, if you were earning, okay, so if you are working because you have to, um, how about setting the limit at 15 grand, 20 grand before you start paying uh, national insurance? Because surely you don't think those people who are earning way more than that, who are loaded and still running their company, that they shouldn't have to pay national insurance? Well, my opinion on people that earn far, far more money than I do, that doesn't affect my life. As long as I get what I earn, I'm happy right. with that. And are you still working? Um, I'm still working. I'll continue to work in um, probably for the next two years. I could have retired in December. And do you want to keep um, working? I do still enjoy working. Yay. But if I, could have, if I could have retired, if I was in a position to retire full time, I probably would have done. Would you really, well, though? Yes. Because I, I, mean, I, I think there's a lot of people, I do a lot of phone-ins, and I get a lot of people who say, I, I don't want to retire, I, don't, I really don't want to retire, and, or I retired and I went back to work. Uh, or and It had nothing to do with the stamp duty, by the way, they just wanted to work. I'm continuing working because I have to. Okay. It's an added bonus that I still enjoy the job what I do, I'm a lovely mm -hmm. driver. All right. And when I could have officially retired. I'd already discussed with my wife that I'm going to continue. Give, I wanted to give it till 70, but she said, no, just see how you feel when you reach 68. So, yeah, we'll take it in, uh, you know, when that, when that comes she'll, up. She'll when change her mind when you're, when you're home all day, won't she? She'll be like, uh, oh, you remember, <laughs> Barry, I said to, to retire? I think you need to go back to work. Well, I think that when I'm away at work, the wife actually enjoys the, the, the free time because uh, I'm not there to, to get on the nerves. Exactly. So she'll be going, oh, I tell you what, you know I said 68. What I meant was 70. <laughs> <laughs> well, she may encourage that. She may want to encourage that. But, I mean, when you mentioned about what, you know, that people who are continuing to work should pay national insurance, um, what uh, has not been thought about is that although I don't pay national insurance anymore, my income pays more tax. Yes, that, I mean, that's tr that, yeah, I suppose that's true because it's just taxed in a different way. Yes. So, but, so if you mean, had to pay national insurance, but what it means is that I suppose with national insurance it means that your boss would have to pay and they don't have to pay that. So they're, well, they're getting you cheaper, so you should ask for a pay rise, really. <laughs> Well, I, I'm happy with the salary I get, so I, I don't. Uh, I won't be doing that. But what they do do when I pay this workplace pension, that's continued to be deducted from my salary. It goes into a workplace pension, and my employer makes a contribution to that anyway. Yeah. So that will increase the workplace pension for when I do retire. I'll have a little nest egg there that we can draw. But but you're already drawing but, your state pension. I'm, I've, I've received the state pension. I gave that some thought, so I deferred it for a couple of years. Um, but I read on it and I thought, well, you know, I was going to take the money now. And um, because if you, if you defer a state pension and, and you die in, no, in year number two, you lose it all. I know, you, you might as well take it. That's what so I I've say. I took it while I can, but I've just got to be careful on what salary I earn. Uh, because that tops it up. Oh, yeah. It does. Well, the state yeah. pension is taxable as well because it's all part of my income. Mm. Uh, and. The, the allowance with personal tax allowance now, the, the state pension swallows up most of that. It, gi it gives me about £1,300 uh, of left in the personal tax allowance. Now, I can earn up to 37700 at 20%. But once it goes over the 37700 it doubles to 40% tax. But only on that bit? Over. Um, only above 37 yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's only the pounds right. abo above 37. That's right. Yeah. So I'm still paying me 20% up to 37,700. Mm. Right. Well, that's the, the, the state pension 
right, he's more or less taxed at, at 20%. Um, we get a little increase in April to, I think I'm going to receive £880 a month. So that's one of the reasons why I will still continue to work, because there's absolutely no way we could survive. Yeah, but your, ta your tax burden is less than that of, let's say, you know, somebody at the younger end whose tax burden can be up to about 80% of their salary. So it, 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 I'm not not earning vast amounts of money just because of the way that tax is taken and the national insurance and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Not to mention the fact that a younger person may never see a pension and they're still paying into it, but they may never see it. Because it'll be well, well, 75 years old, it, won't it? And it'll be, mm -hmm. people will have about four months of, of, of pension before they, they drop off the perch. Well, I think the way age is going now, people do tend to live longer. Uh, healthy people can live longer. Uh, I mean, when my pension... Yeah, but say was... the pension was 72, right? Say you didn't get your pension until 70. They're looking at 71 at the moment. Let's say it's 71, 72. How much fun life have you got after that, most people? Well, you haven't. I agree with that. Mm. Um, I mean, I was looking at some statistics recently, and there's still many more countries, uh, mainly in Europe, where the retirement age is actually higher than ours. Um, so that they'll probably get more of a state pension when they do retire. Mm. But they, I think, uh, most of them are like 70 years old. But we're quite fortunate at the moment it's 66. And yes, at the moment, are, yeah. Yes, at the moment. And they are considering to increase it further, which I disagree with. Personally. Yeah, well, it's not I fair because you, you, you're constantly chasing your pension, aren't you? You know, somebody yeah. who's in their in their fifties may may not see a pension till seventy five, uh, and and I, I mean, and also that's you've worked all your life, and then you're, you know, too old to in most cases to enjoy it. Well, I suppose if, if someone is fortunate to be able to contribute to a private pension. Then that gives them options when they because some people can retire early mm. because they've got a good pension. To yeah, I haven't. I haven't. I've always been freelance, so I've I've got I'm, I'm on a wing and a prayer, Barry. Got nothing. Right. Yeah. Um. So you'll be seeing me here, toothless, haggard. <laughs> <laughs> Well, in just years make to sure come. Wear that pajama top that you've got on right now. Rude. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Barry. <laughs> well, just one more thing. I, on. I, I receive an annuity uh, payment once a month for cash mm. in a small pension when I reach fifty-five, mm. and the pension provider was paying me uh, an extra six, well, sixty-two pounds a month for the rest of my life. Mm. Come January this year, because it was the first month that I started my, my, my pensionable age, I've become a, a qualified OAP, they now tax that at 50%. So I'm a £62 payment, I now get 31 Well, thank you for your contribution. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I'm going to carry on working and I like it. You like it. Good for you, Barry. I'm very All glad right. about that. Although clearly you have absolutely no idea about fashion. But we'll let you off. We'll let you <laughs> off. <laughs> Barry from Wigan, thank you very much indeed. Um, right, some more messages here. Oh, no, we've read those. I've read those, yeah. That bloke who wants a liger, don't do it. Uh, I had one in... Hang on, let me do... Uh, yeah, somebody being silly. Uh, just saying they had one in a, a one-bedroom flat and not only did it chew the furniture, it also scratched all the walls. I had to take it to the local park and let it go. See, this is the problem, isn't it? <laughs> you can't be having people uh, having people like that. Uh, right, what are we looking at time-wise now? Another call... Oh, it's another Barry. Goodness me, they're all coming out of the woodwork. Barry, this one's in Norwich. Hi, Barry in Norwich. What do you uh, make... Hi, uh, hi. What do you make of MP security? Does it concern you? Uh... Well, to be honest with you, right, I wish the MPs would get as, as passionate as they did the other night in the House of Commons about things happening in this country. People using food banks, people unable to pay their energy bills, schools falling apart, you know, uh, illegal immigration. You know, they, 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 they're, they're, they're voting on, well, I didn't even vote today on something that's happening nearly 3,000 miles away. I, I don't think... That Benjamin nobody will Netanyahu, listen to their decision yeah, anyway. I don't think Benjamin Netanyahu is going to go, well, before we fire that missile into Gaza, let's just see what the Labour Party thinks about it or the SNP thinks exactly. about it. It was a nonsense. It was a nonsense. I completely agree with you. It was embarrassing. Yeah. Um, and and, uh, and it was virtue signalling at its 
worse. Well, it, it, it made me feel ill, to be honest with you. It was, yeah, it, was it was pathetic. It was embarrassing and pathetic. And I'm with you on that, Barry. I think that it was just absolute yeah. not... For the sake of this nonsense virtue signaling, get on, yeah. get on and do the work that we paid I you mean, to we, do. We, we, we put them in the Houses of Parliament. Yeah, yeah more for less. For the, well, to do a job for this country, you know, and it just, you know, I, I, I wish they'd get as passionate about that you know, with yeah, but that doesn't that, that doesn't win no. them brownie points, does it? I mean, well, this is no, the whole thing. Well. It's all it's all the virtue signalling. Uh, Barry, thank you. Um, great to speak to you. Thank you very much indeed. Let's talk to Trisha now because she's coming up next. A fabulous Trisha. Hello, Trisha. Hello. Uh, we've got a really action-packed show for you uh, no. coming up. Um, you know, on Sundays, we always have our faith panels. We're going to be uh, dealing with a couple of subjects. One, I don't know if you've seen online that really gut-wrenching video of the guy who shoots, who shot his son in the head after an argument. Um, we're asking about, is there a special place in hell? Or should, should someone like that uh, have forgiveness? That's to our faith panel. Yeah. And with a dis landing on the moon or all those billions spent on landing a man on the moon should we be spending that money here at home with all the problems that we've got and just on that whole issue of, of what you call virtue signaling which i tend to agree with uh when it comes to the uh, vote ceasefire vote i'm actually going to be talking to a councillor who resigned over that so i'm going to be asking her just that her resigning at the council in some town or city what what exactly does that mean you know, well, how does it help the situation? Um, then we are also going to be talking about mind matters, and it's something you've actually touched upon, older workers and the discrimination they uh, face and how it affects their mental health and well-being. So we've got a really full show coming up. Brilliant. And you look stunning, by the way. I love it. I love the look. It's fabulous. <laughs> Trisha, God bless you. Thank you very much indeed. The wonderful Trisha Gardner will be here uh, with you in about a couple of minutes' time, actually, just the other side of, uh, 